We're on. Okay, very good. Good afternoon. Hello. Welcome to Beneath the Planet of the Collections. We are going to take a three-hour tour of uh, 25 years of the Java Collections framework. Okay, my name is Stuart Marks. I'm the project lead of the Core Libraries team at Oracle. I maintain the Collections framework. Um, I'm also known as Dr. Deprecator. I have a few relevant JEPs that I've done here, which are listed here. And uh, if you want to contact me, the best way to do that is on Mastodon. Yeah, um, and I'm Maurice Naftalin, and I have wrote a book about Java, well, I, I wrote half a book about Java generics and collections, and I wrote the half on collections. Um, I wrote uh, a book about um, um, Java 8 as well, so Java 5, big release, Java 8, big release. Java 21 is going to be a really big, big, big release, I, so. I hear, so there's going to be a book about that as well. And I am a member of various community programs, that, and I'm a, a frequent speaker at things. So I'm going to use this opportunity to advertise to you on conferences, because like, like you know, paying attention at this point in the talk. Uh, unconferences are this great idea where people meet, they're, they're technical and social meetings, both. So we've got quite a lot of them running now. They are, they're very informal, they, 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 they go very deeply into technical matters, but they're also very relaxed and informal. And as you can see from the pictures, we have fun. So these are pictures from different unconferences. Uh, they, they include Jay Alba, the one that in Edinburgh that I'm particularly interested in, and Jay Crete, which you've probably heard of because it's, it's, it's more famous. And I'm even going give, to give a special shout out to, oh, you can, you can, you can apply for all of the unconferences on that website, or you will be able to when I get back from this conference and update it. And I'm going to give a special shout out to Jay Alba, which is next running in May 2024 in Edinburgh. And it's a great event, and Edinburgh is a great venue to come to, and everybody who comes says how wonderful it is. So, come. That's an order. Okay. <laughs> in fact, that's an order for you all. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, and one other thing. Sequels can be better. Uh, the Godfather proves that, um, and various, a whole lot of other films don't. Um, so the Java, especially the Planet of the Apes series, <laughs> especially, especially the Planet of the Apes series. After and beneath the Planet of the Apes, by the way, is the worst of them. <laughs> uh, but never mind that. So uh, Java generics. I, 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 I aged the cover of Java generics and collections to show you how old it was because it was published in 2006, 17 years ago, and. In 2023, Java 21 edition, which at the bottom says Morris Naftalin and Phil Wadler, and it will say with Stuart Marks, because Stuart's the technical editor on that. So we're, quite a lot of the wisdom that we're going to, or otherwise, that we're going to impart today comes from the writing of that book, uh, the formulation of our thoughts. Okay, so that's all the intros. The agenda, oh, sorry, the agenda. So the agenda is we're going to, we're going to, the, um, this talk is divided into four parts, uh, fairly unevenly. There's a bit of setup at the beginning, some concepts about collections, things that aren't always completely clear to everybody, uh, views, what, what, are, what collection views are, uh, why we're interested in immutability and unmodifiability, and what the difference is between those. So that's some setup. B is like the really, the really uh, important part of the talk, I think, in practical terms. We've got some guidance and recommendations for using, for using the collections framework. We haven't been able to fit very many in, but we hope that the ones that we have will be helpful. And that's going to be like, the, that's, that's the kind of central part. And then we're going to review some controversies in the design of the collections framework, because any time you have a big piece of software, you have a lot of people arguing about it. And that is definitely the case uh, for the collections framework. And finally, we'll have a quick look at what might lie in the future of the collections framework. So that's, that's how we're going to fill these three hours, I think, or maybe six hours, depending on uh, how long you're prepared to stay. The, uh, the physical uh, agenda is we're going to talk for an hour and a quarter, it, then there'll be a half hour break, and then another hour and a quarter. So the half hour is enough time to go and get a cup of coffee and a comfort break and all that. Okay. okay. Right. It's yours. Is it mine? It is. Okay. All right. So let's start off with some collections concepts. Uh, oh, oh no, that's right. right, right wait, uh, okay. Oh. So we were supposed to right, 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 oh, go, back, go back, go back, right go back, past go back. It. Okay. Right, right. Immediately we've gone wrong. Yeah. So, okay. so, so fortunately that's what the back is for. All right. So we are going to be right. demonstrating some things in J shell. Uh, um, right. 
if I can remember how to run J okay, shell. Run J shell. A zero. Run J shell. A zero. Right. So here, so here we go. Okay. So these are pretty simple. Uh, why don't you just hit? Uh, or you want me to drive that? Oh, it's okay. I'll drive it. Okay. You can just tell me when. Okay. Well, Not a complicated line yeah, of code. So keep keep going a couple more. So we're okay, going to create right. a, uh, a list, and then we're creating a second list, which is a copy of the first one. Now, uh, most of you are probably familiar with ArrayList, but what this does is it creates a copy, and it may be completely obvious, but I have to say it here explicitly, the second ArrayList is completely independent of the first one, and so we'll demonstrate that. Okay, so we're gonna add x to list two, and so what's the result there? Uh, well, list one, should be unaffected, and then list two should should have the, uh, the modification in. Okay, pretty obvious. We have two completely independent collections. Okay, now let's look at example A1. Okay, we'll start off pretty much the same. We start off with a list with some contents, and then instead of creating a copy, we're gonna do something different, which is a sublist. Now, if you don't know what sublist does, well, it takes a subrange of it, but it doesn't extract a subrange as an independent list. The sublist is a view onto the original collection. So list one is now related to list two in a very intimate way. So go ahead there. So we're adding x to list two, and that does the obvious thing. Now look what happened to list one. Okay, so that's interesting. So list two is a view onto list one, and if you modify list to the sublist, that also has the effect of modifying list one. And so do we go the other way? Yes, we do. And so changes go in both directions. If we modify the backing list, and then we look at the sublist again. You've got it. Oh yeah, so we, uh, well no, I think you can look at the sublist again here too, oh, list sorry. two. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah, so we modified list one, which was the original list, and we can see that change in the sublist. So there's something different going on here than happened in the first one. So list two is clearly not independent at all from list one. Okay, right. so that's okay. our right. end there, and right. we go back. Okay, to this right, list. now. Okay. So what was going on there? Well, it's the idea of a collection view, and they're really common in the collection framework. A view is a projection or an image of a collection, and I've tried to draw it in this to, to show what you see is, what you're seeing uh, is a, is, is, is in the sublist is something that looks like an array list, but is actually a window onto the real thing, as it were. And, and the, uh, the extent to which the um, changes are reflected, changes are either transmitted from the view to the backing list and from the backing list back to the view. The extent to which those, uh, that can happen it really depends on, uh, the, on the particular view, and we're going to see different properties of different, of, of different views. So, uh, so, so the idea is that what you're seeing there is just like a little, uh, a li a little slice of the, of, the, of the backing array list. We have different kinds of these things. So the views can be fully modifiable. Sublist is kind of unusual in, in the sense of what you just saw there, which is you can modify the view and it'll change the backing list. You can mod modify the backing structure and it'll change the view. But they're not all like that. And sometimes they may have restricted modifiability, like, like for example, key implementations of key set. So we've got, uh, on the right-hand side there, you've got a, a, a map, which is a set of key value pairs, entries, and you can get the key set of that, and if you get the key set, then that is the set of, well, obviously, it's a set of the keys. And that looks to you, well, if you it, it, looks like, it looks like an ordinary set, but it's not exactly like an ordinary set. Do we demonstrate this? In J Shell, we demonstrate this. That's right. So, okay. so you, can sort of, you can sort of see logically what it would be possible to do with that set and what it wouldn't be possible to do, but we'll actually demonstrate it, I think. Okay, okay so, so you have to finish that one. Yeah, all right. And then, and then let's say, what, what were A4. You four, A4, thank you. So you're going to tell us about this? Okay, yeah, so what happens here? Okay, so we create, uh, we create a, a regular hash map with the... Uh, ooh. Nah, ignore it. Just go on. Okay, so we create a, a regular hash map, and then... Uh, yep, thank you. Okay, so now we get a key set. Okay, so the key set... Kind of sli uh, slight, looks like it slices off the, the, the keys from, from the original map, but as we just saw on the, on the previous slide, 
they're still connected. And so now, okay, so what happens next? Okay, so let's put something new into the map. And of course, that, that, uh, that ends up in the map, as one expects. But the key from the thing we just put in now appears in the key set. So the key set is a live view of the keys of the underlying map. And so as the underlying map gets updated, the key set also appears to change simultaneously. Okay, so now we can actually do modifications on the key set. So what happens when we remove B? All right, so B is gone from the key set, but that might have some effect on the backing map. Well, indeed, if we remove the key from the key set, that has the side effect of writing through to the backing map, and it, remo it actually removes the entry corresponding to that key from the backing map. So again, we have this connection between the view and its backing map, and we have changes flowing in both directions. But what do you think would happen if you tried to add a key to the key set? Right. What could possibly... What? How could it work? We, I don't know. What happens? It couldn't work. It couldn't work because you don't have a value to go with it. Unsupported operation. Unsupported exception. operation exception. For unsupported operation. We'll, we, yeah. we'll, we'll mention unsupported yes, operation. Yes, yes. About which few, more a later. Few, a few times. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so that's an example of a of a view that's partially modifiable um, because of restriction because of restrictions that are in inevitable. If you want to have that view at all, there's just simply no way that you can imagine how you could add a, how you could add a key to that because like you don't have a value to add to it as well. So, so, so that's the second kind. And the third kind are um, views that are completely unmodifiable. So those have been in, uh, in the JDK since uh, 1.2, uh, provided by the wrapper, uh, by the methods that uh, put wrapper classes around your, around your collections in the, in the collections class. So collections are unmodifiable collection, unmodifiable list, unmodifiable mm -hmm. set and so on, uh, will give you something that simply can't be mutated at all through, that re through a reference to it there. Right. But that doesn't mean the whole thing is, is uh, unmodifiable. So the unmodifiable wrapper really is a wrapper around a, co a collection that can still be modified, which right. we are going to demonstrate here. So you, want, you, want, you want to do, the, you want to yeah. do A5? Then. Yeah. Right. Okay, then. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start off with our... Uh, our, our usual uh, usual things here. Uh, right, okay, yeah, so we start off with a list, and then now, here, list two, we're gonna, this is another collection view, it's a different kind of collection view, it's an unmodifiable view. List two is an unmodifiable view of list one. Okay, so now, we can still modify list one, since we still have a reference to it, we still can modify it, and so when we do that, then, List one is still modifiable. Nothing happened to it. It's still a regular array list. And if we look at list two, those changes to the backing list show up in the view. But now if we try to modify list two, since it's an unmodifiable list, it prevents modifications on it, and therefore changes to the unmodifiable view cannot be made, and, and, and this protects the backing uh, the backing list or the backing collection from being modified. Okay, so those those are the three kinds. The mut mutator methods that are not supported by views are called optional methods, and they turn up all the time in the collections framework. And in an unmodifiable view, the last the last one we looked at, all the optional methods throw unsupported operation exception. So we'll be talking quite a lot more about unsupported operation exception mm -hmm. and modifiability and whether this is a good thing and why we have it and so on. That's uh, that's a big part. That's a big part of the talk because it's a big part of dealing with the collections mm -hmm. API. So, what is the what are we really aiming at here? The, what's the point of why are we interested in being in stopping things from being uh, modified. I mean, sometimes we don't have any choice, like with key set there. But sometimes we choose not to, like with the unmodifiable wrappers. So let's think of a minute about immutability. An immutable object is one whose entire state graph can't be changed observably after construction. That's, so people are qu often quite confused about this concept because they think, well, an immutable object is one where you can't change the fields. But it's not just a matter of you can't change the fields. If the fields are reference fields, then you can't change anything in the objects that they're referring to. And if they're referring to things, 
Well, the things that they refer to might contain, might have reference fields, and in that case, those things can't be changed either. The entire graph of all the things that are connected by reference can't be, can't be changed in any way. So immutable objects are really are can't be changed. And we'll see that that's a bit different from the idea of unmodifiability. Java objects can be immutable, but it can't be done via, there's no, there's no way in the type system that you can just say, I want this thing to be immutable. You have to go to quite a lot of trouble. There are recipes for doing this, and the one that we have here is out of effective Java, or it's kind of slight modification of the one in, in effective Java uh, by Joshua Bloch, which is kind of a good reference for this. And it's, and it's, a, and it's a good... Um, and it's, a, and it's a good recipe for making immutable objects. An immutable object has to have, obviously, the, the, it can't have any mutators. So you can't have any methods that change the state, or it's clearly not immutable. It's only got private and final fields, well, because subclassing might be a problem, but th they've clearly got to be private. And if it has any mutable components, it, it's, it's, it has exclusive access to them. So it can have mutable components, but that's fine as long as it isn't going to mutate them and nobody else can get at those components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see this most often with arrays. And in Java, arrays are a fundamental construct. And there's, there's no such thing as an unmodifiable array. And so, but there are a lot of classes which, in fact, are immutable, where they create and initialize an array and just decide never to modify it again. Right. So why are, we why are we interested in this when what's all this focus on immutability about? I mean, after all, we are programming in Java, which is a language which uh, all of whose programs depend on mutating data structures. I mean, that's what you do in a Java program all the time. So why are we suddenly so interested in immutability? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons, and w there are two... Uh, th th there, there's too many of them to go into in detail in this talk. But roughly speaking... The, the, a very big one is they provide thread safety. So, so you know that immutable objects can be concurrently modified or concurrently accessed by uh, by any number of threads, and you've got no chance of uh, race conditions or anything or, or, or any problems with destructive interference between threads. That's a big deal, especially because you quite often don't know whether or not your program, your your data structures are going to be uh, concurrently accessed. Uh, you, could, you don't need to worry about encapsulation. We're going to talk a lot about defensive copying uh, later on in this talk and, and the, the ability to defend your state from uh, interference by other, by other objects. Well, you don't have to worry about that if your, st if your state can't be modified because it's immutable. It saves a lot of, it saves a lot of hassle. Um, if you are using your, um, if, you, if, these are, if you're putting your objects into uh, keyed collections or into uh, ordered collections like uh, tree set, then if they uh, can't ever be mutated, you eliminate a whole lot of errors that, that, uh, that happen if those keys c are, are changed accidentally after, the, uh, after an object's been inserted. Your program state is m much easier to, uh, is much more likely to be consistent because you've got less opportunities for things that have been uh, modified to get out of step with one another. And in general, programs that, have a, that uh, don't have a lot of different possible states are much simpler and clearer and easier to reason about. That's all I want to say about that slide. Okay. It, was, it was a run through. There's every one of those points could be a talk in itself, but we're not going <laughs> to we're not going to go there. Let's just say that we're very interested in it, and it's a good thing if we can achieve it. But it's quite difficult, and in particular with collections. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. What do you what do you want to say about unmodifiability, okay. Stuart? Because I think I, I think this is your thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Why not? Okay, so so there's a lot of confusion over the difference between immutability and unmodifiability. And so Morris just said that immutability is a deep property of an object graph. And so since it's a deep property, you can't, you, you, you can't say, here's a collection and this collection is immutable because the collection has no control over what you put into it. So if you have a collection and say, okay, well, I, I want this collection to be immutable, and then you go and put a mutable object into the collection, the, the whole thing is mutable. And in fact, most collections, the, the hash code of a collection is a function of the hash, code, hash codes of the contents of the collection. So if one of those objects is mutable, then the entire hash code of the collection will also change. And it gets mutated, sorry. If, if, if one of the contents 
is is mutable and it's it's mutated so that, such that its hash code changes, then the entire collection's hash code changes. And so if you have something whose hash code can change, it's clearly not immutable, even if it's unmodifiable. So what we say is unmodifiability is a property of the collection itself. Basically, maybe the contents of the collection, like the references in the collection, cannot be changed. But that's not a statement about the deep properties of the, the elements themselves. Sometimes people call this shallow immutability, which is kind of descriptive but a bit confusing because it's not immutability at all. But it gives you an right. it, but it gives you a clear impression. Only the contents, only the direct contents of the collection are protected from, right. from modification. Yeah, okay. So suppose, though, we, like, like Morris was just talking about, if you want to build up an entire object graph that is immutable, but then one of, the, one of the objects in the graph is a collection. If you want the entire graph to be immutable, then such collections must be unmodifiable. Because if they're not unmodifiable, then somebody can go in and change the contents of the collection, and once again, you've lost immutability. So uh, unmodifi unmodifiability of a collection is necessary but not sufficient for, um, for immutability of an entire object graph. Okay. okay. So, so why would we want... Okay, so there are good, a number of good things about, about unmodifiability. One, it prevents accidents, right? So for instance, like I was, uh, I was saying... Um, uh, previously, sometimes you will create a data structure like an array or something else, initialize it, and therefore, by convention, decide never to modify it again. Well, if you want to enforce that, a good way to do that is to use an unmodifiable collection. And then, finally, unmodifiability will help enforce encapsulation. And so it will, if, if you have something that is mutable, uh, and you want to keep control over mutations, but you also want to make that visible to others, uh, then, then you can encapsulate that by, by using unmodifiable wrappers. Okay. Okay. Right. So that is our setup that we're going to find quite useful uh, in, as we go on to talk about the other things we're going to do. Right. So we are on to part B now, where we're going to try to give you some good advice about uh, how, to, how to use the collections framework and uh, how to do object design in general in, uh, in Java, because the, the two things are kind of intertwined. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, well, it's advice. You, well, I guess you'll let us know whether it's good. <laughs> it's good advice. Most of it comes from him. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely good. OK. Right. OK. Right. You good? Yep. OK. okay. Uh, all right, so I start, uh, right? Yeah, you do indeed. Okay, all right. So this is kind of builds on what I just said about this idea of encapsulation and ownership and so forth. So, um, so think about an object that just has some fields like primitives or something like that. Most of the time, we want to create an object and we want control over who can modify those fields. So you make those fields private. You don't make them, because if you made the fields public, then anybody out, you know, any code out there could go in and directly modify a field. And so we've learned that if we want to encapsulate the data in an object, then you make those fields be private and you control access to them through methods, getters and setters and things like that. Okay, now suppose one of your fields is a collection. You have to think about the same kinds of things, but you have to apply some additional effort to keep control over your collections. So the main concern is mutation of those collections, right? So if you, um, if you expose a collection, then you know, anybody who gets their hands on a reference to that collection might be able to mutate it. So you might want to take steps to prevent that if, if you're concerned about encapsulation. Uh, and so one of the things about where collections differ from fields, though, is that uh, you can expose a collection, but we can use those unmodifiable views we talked about earlier to expose a collection, but only on a read-only basis. And so that will prevent people from mutating the collection. So that preserves encapsulation, while it, while it gives uh, access uh, to clients to read through the collection. Okay, so let's, uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna go through a uh, somewhat involved example here. Um, 
uh, the example code we have is, you know, imagine some kind of system where you have a graph, and a graph consists of nodes and edges, and uh, we want to maintain an invariant that a node is always connected to the rest of the graph. And so the way we do that is we enforce, uh, we enforce an invariant that a node must always have at least one edge. Okay, so we have a node class. It has a private set of edges. Okay, so we have a nice private field there. Very good. In our constructor, we require the client to pass in an edge, and we create a new hash set and add that edge into, into, our, into our private hash set. Okay, so that's good, but clients also want to be able to modify the structure of the graph. So we've added, uh, or we've, we've provided add edge, remove edge. Uh, they probably also want to look through all the edges, and so we provide a way to get an iterator over the edges and so forth. So I'm the client representative. I'm a, I'm a representative of the, of the client programmer for this API, and I have to say, I don't like it because it's just so inflexible. Like, supposing I want to stream these edges. The, the edges that belong to a node. You've yeah. just given me this very restricted access. Come on. Yeah, so we could add a whole bunch of more things like what Morris wants. Yeah. But maybe, okay, so let's run with this. Why don't we try, uh, why don't we try just, just, just exposing... Let me, just let me get at the edges. Okay. All right. All right. Like, like that. Go. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right. Well, so, so we don't need to have add and remove uh, methods anymore, because if the client wants to add and remove, it just gets the set of edges, and it can modify the set directly. So that's good. Um, but there's a problem here now, which oh. is that the, the client can remove, it can remove edges, and in fact, it no longer has control over, uh, so, sorry, it, it has uncontrolled access. To, to, to this node's but collection. I, I'm the client representative. You can trust me. <laughs> Would you trust him? <laughs> I never no. make mistakes. No. <laughs> right? So in particular, the client can remove all the edges, and it can remove the last edge, and so now we violated our invariant that we set up earlier that says that every node has to have at least one edge. Or the client can call clear, which is a quick way of doing that. So, so that's no good. So, so clearly, so clearly uh, we, we, need to, we need to fix that we've, because we've lost encapsulation because we've exposed a reference to our internal collection which is mutable. All right, so okay. how are we going to so, fix this? Well, what you could do is what you could do. I mean, I'm not going to be happy about this, but you could actually just return me an, unmod an unmodifiable view yeah. of the uh, an unmodifiable view of the edges right so okay. now i can now i can stream it right which is what i wanted to yeah, do that's true. but i can't but i can't do those <sighs> as though i would those evil things that he's uh, accusing me of wanting to do right so so the problem i mean so so but you i'll i'll, I'll be very charitable morris uh you you know the idea of exposing collection is not a bad one because exposing the collection gives clients a lot of flexibility, right? To stream, to call contains, to call size, all kinds of things like that. The problem is in exposing a mutable version of the collection. And so here, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's, let's create an unmodifiable view of the collection and then hand that out to anyone who wants it. So the clients have read-only access to this collection, but we preserve the right inside the node we reserve the right only to ourselves, the, 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 the code in the node class, to be able to do the, any mutation. But, but now you've taken away my ability to add a, to add a node, to add an All edge. Right. Okay, All yeah, right. so we still have more work to do. I just, I just can't win with you. No, you can't. All right, so what we'd have to do is add back mutator methods. Okay, so we can add, we can, we can, we can write an add edge method, and we can write a remove edge method that removes an edge. Uh, but we're actually doing some checking here. So what we do is we say, okay, uh, you can remove edges as long as you want, ex unless you're going to about to remove the last edge. And so we check for that and throw an exception instead. So this preserves our invariant. So here what we're doing is by reserving the ability to mutate this collection to inside our node class, we can continue to enforce our, the invariants that we'd set up. Well, I am glad, I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that at last I have a library developer here who's actually listening to something that, uh, that, that the client programmers are saying, because it's quite unusual. But I'm still not very happy about this, because like, 
Why don't you, I mean, it would be a lot more convenient if when I've created a node, I don't have to then painstakingly add the edges one by one. Why don't you give me a constructor that will let me add a whole bunch of edges at one time? Okay, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. All right, so let's add a constructor here. And so uh, it takes a set of edges that the client passes in. And so again, here's this idea of being able to enforce our invariants. If the client passes us in an empty set, that would create a disconnected node in the graph, and we don't want that. So we say we make sure that the, that the set is not empty before initializing uh, our class. Okay, and then uh, the rest of the class is the same. Yeah. Yeah, but but I am seeing a problem about this. I mean, like it doesn't. No. It shouldn't. It shouldn't no, come. It shouldn't possible. come from me. But actually, I think there's a problem with your API here. Really. Yeah, I, I, I think there is. So supposing I took a set of edges which belong to one node and passed them into the constructor for another one. How would that work? Okay, well, let's see what happens if you do that. All right, so let's, let's create a node the old-fashioned way by passing in an edge and then adding a couple edges manually. And then do, so that's node one. And so get the edges from node one and then pass that return value to, no, to, to a node constructor to create node two. And so... Yeah. Okay. So that's that's no good because um, so remember get so you have to remember on the previous slide get edges wraps the the set in an unmodifiable set. So node one has its own hash set and node two goes through an unmodifiable unmodifiable set which is a view onto the very same hash set that node one has. So that's, remember we were talking before about how if you, if you, if you write something into a set, it's visible through the view. So if you, if you mutate node one, then, then that has the side effect of mutating node two. So yeah, that's no good because they, they share structure right, now. Right, yeah, okay. So yeah. I, think, I think you made a mistake. How do I submit a ticket to the uh, collections, uh, to the <laughs> Oracle collections framework? Uh, Let's see, is there a trash can here? <laughs> Uh, yeah, you think he's joking. <laughs> so, uh, you, the, so, you, the, so the mis so the mistake you the mistake you clearly made okay. was in returning an unmodifiable uh, was in returning an unmodifiable view of the internal nodes because that's exactly what gives rise to this. You'd have been better off if you'd have made a if you'd have made a copy of the of, of those. Okay, of the, so of the, in the, of those in the edges, getter, of those so, edges. So in the getter, make yeah, it, yeah, yeah. The, yeah so, so the getter, you return a copy of those edges like that. Yeah. Okay. So so we'll change the getter so that instead of returning an unmodifiable set, we'll return a copy of our internal. Okay. So that's that's better because now we're no longer exposing the our internal collection. We're handing whoever calls the getter. We're just handing them a copy which is independent. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. Right. That's much better. All right, so let's okay, so so just move right, on from right, there. Yeah, okay. so as you can see, so if we run the same scenario again, we create node one with some edges, and then we get the edges from node one and pass them to node two. Now, now we're good. We, node one and node two have uh, do, no longer share structure, and they each have independent hash sets. So I think we're good, right? Well, yeah, I have a friend though who's kind of who quite like quite enjoys. I won't I won't tell you. I won't say his name out loud, but I think. Um, Stuart knows who I mean, who quite enjoys breaking this kind of thing. And he told me, he looked at this and he said, well, actually, supposing I create a set of edges and then passed it to the constructor, of two d same set, to passed it to the nope. constructor of two different nodes. Why would you ever want to do that? I, I, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I would never do such okay, a thing. Okay, so what, ha what, what, what does that look like? It looks like that. Okay. It looks like that, I'm afraid. And once again, the nodes are not independent. Yeah, ah, right. Okay, so yeah, so we create a hash set and then, and then pass the same hash set to two different nodes. And yeah, we're back to uh, structural sharing. So yeah, that's, that's, yeah, your friend is pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, okay. you know, I think you know who I mean. Uh, and it's worse than that, isn't it? Because How could it be worse? How could it be worse, Morris? Because, well, I mean, you've now given, the, you've given my friend control over what a node contains. So supposing, for example, that, um, I mean, I, I don't know what, what makes him want to do these things, but suppose he created an unmodifiable set and mm -hmm. passed that to one of your nodes. Everything's going to break, isn't it? Because the node thinks that, it's the, that, the, that the set of edges are its property. Okay. They're its state. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, right. So, so you're going to be. So those nodes are just not going to work properly at all. 
he's broken your system, hasn't he? All right, so we create an unmodif... So set.of, if you recall, creates an unmodifiable set. And so that's what, that's, that's what we have here. And then we pass the same unmodifiable set to both create node one and node two. And so then now they... Now not only do they share structure, but, but at least you, you can't modify them. And, but if you try to modify them, then you get unsupported operation exception. You know, you know, maybe your friend is right. This collections framework really sucks. <laughs> and you, that's from the horse's mouth. <laughs> okay, so what do we say? All right, I, I'm, supposed to give, I'm supposed to give you the, okay. give the, give the, right, the answer So what are we doing here? wrong here, yeah. Morris? Uh, pardon? What are we doing wrong? We're, what, what we're doing wrong is we're making the copy in the wrong place. That, that's, that's the issue. It's our state, so we should be protecting it. Um, and if something, uh, if we get some input data, we should make sure that it really is our input data and that we, uh, that we know exactly what it's about. Th I'm speaking as a node here. Um, it's, 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 it's part of my state. I need to understand it. I need to be able to control it properly. I've, to, I've, I've made the copy, in the, you're making the copy, you're making the copy in the wrong place. You want to make the copy as it comes in. Right. And then, then you know exactly what it is you've got. Okay, so what does that look like? It looks like that. All right. So we've made a new hash set, and we've taken the edges that we've been given, the set of edges we've been given, which could be unmodifiable, but that's fine, and we've made our own set of it. And so edges now is our property, uh, speaking as a node, it's our property, we have complete control over it, we know exactly, we know exactly what it consists of, and we know exactly how it mm -hmm. can be changed. Good idea. Right. Okay. And then, in the getter, we had changed. We th we thought it would be a better idea to make a copy there, but it turns out it's not necessary to make a copy there. So there, we can go back to returning an unmodifiable wrapper, because that gives us the goodness of being able to expose the collection to clients, but preventing them from mutating it. Right. Okay. Well, they okay. survived. They survived that that whole thing. Okay. I'm amazed. All right. So here's the summary. So. Um, so there are some, some, I think we established some guidelines here for how and when to, to make defensive copies and use unmodifiable wrappers. So if something is passing, so you consider you, know, you being an object and you want to protect yourself. If somebody is passing you a collection, then if you want to store that collection, you should make a defensive copy first. That way you can make sure nobody else has a reference to it and can mutate it without your knowledge about it. Now that you have a collection internally, if that is mutable, never let that reference leak outside. So don't return it from a getter, or, or if you're really paranoid, don't pass it to any method that you call. Because you know it's very strange. Sometimes people will have side effects on arguments that you pass in. So, but but yeah, if you if you keep, if you keep jealous control over that reference to the mutable collection then you will protect yourself. So anytime you want to hand out a collection, wrap it in an unmodifiable wrapper. Now, if your state is already an unmodifiable collection, then you don't need to wrap it again. So then that's one of the nice things about that. You can just hand them out and be assured that nobody can, can, can modify them. Um, there's the flip side of the rule, which is we've said, OK, create defensive copies, and your mutable collections belong to you, so when you mutate them, you're in total control over them. The flip side of it is don't mutate collections that, or don't attempt to mutate collections that you don't own. And so if somebody hands you a collection, then if you mutate that, well, that, that might not belong to you. So that might have a side effect of, of modifying somebody else's internal state, like if they forgot to, uh, uh, if they forgot to wrap it in an unmodifiable wrapper. So it's okay to read collections that people pass into you, but if you want to store them, you should make a defensive copy. Um, so anyway, so actually that works uh, both ways. Only mutate collections that you own. Do not mutate collections that you do not own. Now, it turns out if you follow these rules, you will never get unsupported, uh, unsupported operation exception because the only collections you're mutating are ones you have total control over, and you have, uh, when you have total control, you can, you can make sure that the collections that you create are the ones that are properly mutable in the way that you need to mutate them. Okay? All right. Very good. All right. Okay. So, All right. Okay. Time. So that's the end of, uh, okay. of the, our first piece of okay. uh, so, wise so advice. Time just, Time check. So we are 40 minutes in. Okay. Okay, that's 
All right. Okay. Well, well, we're doing right. okay. We're doing, okay. Yeah. we're doing sort of okay. Right. Expensive objects. What's an expensive object? I don't pay for my objects. I do pay for my objects, actually. Yeah. My objects are quite expensive. With They've got like a lot of fields on them. I worked on a commercial project where the objects were given representations of like database, huge database objects. And we had like dozens of fields, and a lot of them were strings. Comparing those things for equality, very expensive indeed. What are, what are we going to do about that sort of thing? So, Stuart, I've got a... Oh, person B, as we call you. <laughs> uh, I, I've got this... Uh, very uh, I, I thought I was just... Man. <laughs> man, man. Uh, I've, got this, I've got this very expensive object, which is represented by a book, and, uh, and I've, only got, I, I've only got a few fields here, but I'm going to have a lot more, and it's got a title, an author, a publisher, and a page count. And I've, I've defined the equality uh, method on it because um, books are uniquely identified by the title and the author. Right? There's no, you, you, we're going to set aside... The, the possibilities of the of books, different kinds, different uh, uh, physical books having the same title and author. We're not interested in e-books and that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, and I've made the hash code out of the out of the title and the author. And my my, my question to you is this, Mr. Collections Expert. Mm -hmm. I've got these things at the moment. I've got these things. Uh, at, right. So what I need to be able to do, I've got I've got quite a lot of them, and I want to be able to retrieve all the editions of a book with the given title and author. And uh, what kind of collection should I keep them in? And what, uh, I, have I, did I choose the right fields for equality? So what I've got at the moment, my current solution is I've got them in a list. And when I want to find out whether or not a book is in that list, that my library, um, my library stock is a, uh, is, a, is a list of book, and I just iterate over it. Um, and if I find that I've got... Uh, I've given an, with a given author and title, if I find that I've, that, that, um, I've got a book in there with, with, this, with an equal author and an equal title, hey, I've found it. And I can return true for Hus book and I can return the, the book itself if I, uh, if I want to know what the other fields are. So that's, that seems to work okay, but unfortunately, it's kind of slow. And, 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 and as my collection of expensive objects gets larger, this doesn't seem to me to be uh, uh, optimal. They get, I'm getting complaints. Right. Okay. Well, so maybe you should put them in a hashed collection. A hashed collection. Well, that's quite a good idea. Let me think about what kind of hash collections we've got. Well, I've only got these things here. So um, putting them... Uh, the, the most basic hash collection I know, which seems appropriate here, is, to, is a set. So I'm going to put them in a set. And, uh, yeah, the problem is, like, I, I want to use the contains method to find out if they're there. So I've got an idea about this. Why don't I um, create a, like, a kind of a f a fake object which has just got the fields that I want to that I'm that I'm searching on, right? Because book and author, because title and author uniquely define a book. So I, so if I make a constructor here, I don't care about the other fields. If I'm looking for containment. Uh, then, then the equals method simply tests for title and author. So this looks to me like it'll work. And I, now can, I can now keep my uh, library in the set, which is great. And I've got this really fast way of um, uh, testing for containment, testing whether the book is there, I mean, that, which is one very important part of my uh, use case scenario. So yeah, this looks good to me. Yeah, so something funny is going on here, though. Okay, so you have a book, so your, your, your library has real books in it, right? So the books have title, author, publisher, page count, ISBN, all kinds of data in them, right? But you want to, you, you want to check to see if a book is in a library, but you don't have the book that you're checking, so what you have to do is you have to create this fake book, which is just the title and the author, but all those other fields are null or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you, so uh, well, they, have, they don't matter. So you now have two kinds of books. You have the real books and you have these fake books, and the fake books are just have the, it's this object that has this, th this weird state in it, right? Mm. So, so I think there's something funny with your object design here. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I, that's just a pedantic objection. <laughs> Go on, you, I think okay. you might find another problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so great. So now you can, you can, you can check to see whether a book is in the library. Yeah, it's really neat. But, but if you, if you have a fake book and you want to get the real book, how, how are you going to get it? All right. Uh, I'll call the get method of set. There's no get method on set. All right. 
Okay. And All yes, right. I, yes, I've received a request to add one. The answer is no. <laughs> That's another one of those tickets that went in the bin. There is, there's no get method on set. It wouldn't really make any sense, even though in some frameworks it has been implemented. But we don't think, right. we don't think it really makes any sense. What, can you, what kind of a hashed collection can you get something from? Well, the answer is right. obvious. You can get it from a map. Right. So I have a better idea now. You've given me a better idea. Thank you for the better okay, idea. Yeah, that, that, I'm was, going that was my line, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make a map yeah. now that, uh, that, that, that will, allow me to retrieve, uh, will allow me to retrieve the book. And it's great because I'm, I'm going to dismiss this pedantic objection that he has to fake books. And I'm gonna, now going to have a map from book to book. The keys are going to be these fake books, which has just got the fields I'm interested in, and the, and the values are going to be the real books. I'm very happy with this. And you can see the get book method now is really straightforward. Yeah, okay, so, so that will work. And so I think a map is a better data structure here because what, you wanted, what, what you're essentially doing is you have some subset of the data and you're using that to look up something else. So that's a map operation. And so I think people get themselves into trouble when they start off with a set. And then if somebody asks for set.get, it's like, that's very strange, right? So you get into these weird situations where if somebody's asking for set.get, what they really want is a map. But I still think there's something about your object design, because as your system gets more complicated, if you have a mixture of real books and fake books flowing around, floating around, Sooner or later, your fake books are going to get mixed in somewhere, and somebody's going to ask for the publisher of, of, a, of a book, and it's going to be a fake book, and you're going to get a null pointer exception. So I kind of think this is, 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 is uh, an accident waiting to happen. A cleaner way to do this, though, is to say, OK, instead of having a fake book, we're saying what we really want to do is to be able to look up books by title and author. So we could have a map from title to book or a map from author to book, but what we have is actually a composite key. So why don't you create a new class that contains just the title and author and use that as the key in the map? But you mean, what, you mean like with uh, equals and hash, yeah. hash code? Yeah. That's such a lot of work for just like one, one lookup. There are ways of doing this, Morris. <laughs> oh, right, I've heard of those. Yes. Records, Yes. what a good idea. We'll, uh, a record gives you exactly what it is you want here. It's already got the equals and the hash code defined. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's perfect. And, you, don't, and you, can, you can define it in a single line. So you've got your composite key. We, we really did used to have to do what I was complaining about before, uh, before records came along, before Java 16. But now we've got this really neat and clean way of creating composite keys. This is, this is the, the right answer to the problem of retrieving expensive objects. Right. I think this is a, a better example of object design. So, so, you, so with records, so, so yeah, so I think that one of those, it's one of those things where um, in the past, when the language d did not support constructs like this, you really would have to go through the, the effort of creating a separate class, defining a hash code and equals, because you had to do those in order for those objects to be used as part of a map key. Now that records do this for you, you can define one of these composite keys as a record in one line. So, so this top line here, public record title author, that is the entire declaration. This is not, there's no hidden dot, dot, dot in here, right? So this has a proper equals and hash code and two string that are generated from the, um, uh, from the, the uh, record components that you define in parentheses right there, the title and the author. Um, so, so this is really good, um, but the fact that they implement equals and hash code means that you can use this one-liner to declare a record and use it immediately as a map key. So where do you get the, this title author record from? Well, what you can do is you can also, now it's not shown here, but what you can do is you can add a static factory method that says, all right, given a book, extract the key from it. And so you can pass those keys around and then do lookups and sorting and all kinds of interesting things that you could do with them. So, so with records, you have a very, um, a very uh, useful way of using, um, compo using records to create composite keys for map lookups. And, and so here, here's another thing too, which is that when, <coughs> when, when, when people are, are putting objects into maps and stuff, the the equals and hash code of your actual domain object, like the book, are in a very privileged position. And so if you have to do things like, 
looking up by different fields, then there's pressure on equals and hash code to support different kinds of lookup. But if you move the lookup keys into a separate object, like title author here, or if we had a different one, which is author publisher, right? So maybe you wanted to look up all the books by a particular author by, that were published by a particular publisher, you extract that into a separate key object that has its own equality and hash code uh, uh, methods on it as defined by the records, and then you can create a map from that different composite key to your books, and you don't have to disturb the object design of the book itself. Okay, so we've got the, so we've got the, the, answer, the answer that we want. This is an example. I was, um, I was uh, teaching lambdas in the class yesterday, and, and it just came to me again, just how even though you could have done everything, you sort of could have done everything you can do with lambdas with anonymous inner classes, but just having the right language construct mm. makes doing the right thing so much easier. And, and, right. and that's, that's, made a kind of, that's made a really big difference in, to this particular case, uh, for, for example. So, good. So that's collections of expensive objects. That's our recommendation for how to handle those. And uh, we've got uh, custom collections for, 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 this, for this next part. And what we want to do uh, is for this, we've got... Um, this is where we get the... This, is that right? Custom collections. There you are. Right. It's, it says that you're supposed to say something here. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So you're going to... And this is in the... Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to try, okay. try and find the ID okay. for this. All right. So one thing that... Uh, one use case that we run across uh, fairly frequently is when somebody wants to create a collection that is just like one of the existing ones, but they want some, some special case behavior. And um, so, I mean, sometimes the special case behaviors are, are, are you know, kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of hard to imagine, but sometimes but people's applications have all kinds of different requirements that, that I'm, not, uh, I'm not privy to. But one, one such example is you might want to have a collection that is just like a list in every way, except the first element is a special element and it can never be changed. So it's like, okay, how do we do that? So um, what, what uh, people often try to do is they say, okay, well, I'm gonna take array list, and since we have an object-oriented system, what we can do is we can subclass array list and then start overriding methods until we get the behavior we want. So do you want to uh, start doing that, Morris? Yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be a list with a fixed first element from array right. list. And it's, so it's um, uh, going to have a constructor, I think. And the constructor is going to take, um, it's, gonna it's not going to take anything, is it? So we uh, no, it's going to take our fixed first element. It's going to take our fixed first element. So we um, can just, oh, I, don't, I don't even know how to do that here. So I'll just say public. Um, list with fixed first element, um, and I'm going to take a uh, an element e, right? E element, and I'm going to put that into. Uh, I'm going to say super. Well, what am I going to say super? Uh, I'll say super, and then I'll say um, add. I think just yes. Add e. Ah, right. Add, yeah, add e l. Okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Okay then. Right now, why is, it, wh why is what's the objection oh, there? From uh, it has to have the same name. Return. Uh, uh, sorry, same same from thing. array list. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. You can tell how much I enjoy um, uh, live coding. That's not my thing. So why I volunteered to do it here, I yeah. do not know. Okay. Right, okay, so how can we... Uh, All right, so yeah, so yeah, what, are, right. what are some methods that we might need to, uh, to override? Uh, probably, okay, so what can remove. we need to uh, uh, remove? Oh, remove? That's a good one. Yeah, yeah so we want to prevent people... So, rem so list has a remove by index, so okay, that would so be uh, public, pu public, public, public E. No, pub it's an E. This is E, isn't yeah, it? I just have to... Yeah. Yeah. Public remove, e, remove, remove. Uh, and we'll say by index. Yeah. Okay. okay, so All right. what it, do we, we have overridden it, which is what we wanted. And we want to say, well, okay. we obviously don't want to allow the first element to be, um, to be removed. So I'll say, um, oh, I don't want that. So I'll say if 
well, ah. Ah. right, so I want to say, well, I'm inheriting from, the, from this thing, aren't I? So I could say um, super.remove. I'm usually going to want to do uh, super.remove. Right, okay. So that's going to be in there somewhere. Yeah, right. Okay, so it's going to be in there somewhere, but, but, it's, but clearly you're going to have to uh, actually surround it by, a, by some protection to say that I, if the index is non-zero, then, right. uh, then, I'm, then I'm prepared to do that. And if it is, and if it is zero, okay. I'll, I'm, I haven't got time to think about this too much, so I'll just say I'm going to throw a new legal argument exception yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I forget a message. Okay. Yeah, yeah, message. <laughs> uh, that'll, I think that will do. Right, okay. okay. This is live coding. Folks. Yeah, the live live coding is done by experts. Okay. Okay. So we've done remove. I think. Oh wait. Oh no no. Okay. Sorry, so I've got, I've got to re uh, return. Right. No no no. At the, in in here. Oh, return right, yeah, super yeah. dot remove. Return. Re right. uh, yeah, I'm returning super dot remove. Right. Okay. Cool. Oh yeah, that's right. Because I'm returning the thing. Yeah. Yeah. No return. 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 Yeah. return. Just, 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 ha just have pity. Just testing. Just, just, you just, have to do that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just have sympathy. That's all. Right. Okay. okay so we've done. So we've all done right. that. Okay. This, this is going quite well. Okay. Uh, so what else is there? So add. If we have the add that takes an element, right, that. Yeah. But that can't. That can't modify. That can't modify the first element. Perfect. So that. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. So. Uh, yeah, so there are a bunch more. So add, but there's an add with an index. So why don't we work on that one? Let's try add in index. Yeah, comma. It, it is the index comes first, doesn't it? Uh, e element. Yeah, that's overridden. Cool. Okay. So for some reason, so why is it objecting to boolean? Uh, I think that returns void. Uh, that one returns void, does it? Okay. Yeah. Right, silly thing. Right. Oh, you're. Somehow that, that ah, how did that happen? I don't know. It, 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 I, I don't understand how, how to work this thing. Um, right. You'd think it was. Okay. Right. So okay. we kind of so need to do the same thing, right? right? If index is not equal to zero. Oh, you were trying to cut and, cut yeah. and paste it. Uh, and yeah. I've done it. No, I wasn't. Oh, you weren't? No, I was yeah. just getting it wrong. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call super.add index element. Um, but only if it's not. Um, only if it's not. A, only if index is not zero. Is that right? Right. I think it's the same. Uh, yeah. So if you add, if you add starting at index one, that shifts everything else down, but it leaves the, the the element zero, which is the first element, unchanged. So I think we're okay there. So we have to do kind of the same thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's, um, no, no, no. That's not what I want. Ah. No. Ah. Honestly. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Ah, that's not at all what I want to do. I will get it right in the end. Right, so that's like that. Ah, ah, I'll get it. Don't worry. I'll get it. I know you're panicking ah, now, Stuart, but... Wow, okay. You're right. Magic. <laughs> don't, say, don't say wow, like, I managed to do... He actually got it right. <laughs> I managed okay. to type it. <sighs> I generally get an ironic round of applause at this point because I managed to type a method in. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so actually, okay, could right. you, could how, you... How is this going? Oh, yeah, that? right. No. Okay, so let's um, authorize that. Okay. All right, um, so what, is, what are we looking at? We're yeah, looking that at that one. one. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we've done remove and add, and how much time do we have? <laughs> um, uh, we've got another an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's dig in. No. Um, how, <laughs> how many more methods are there? I don't know. I'll tell you what. I, what I do know about IntelliJ is it'll tell you what, what you can override from the superclass. Let's have a look. Should we have a look? Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've, uh, we're okay. all right with add. Um, we're all right with add all because that adds on to the end. Well, add all has an index. Takes okay. Index. Yeah. We'll have to so override that's gonna, that. That's going to give us some trouble. So okay, there's so that those one. We'll have to override that. Clear. Now yeah, we'll that's gonna clear. that's gonna make some trouble. Um, Contains okay equals um, for each is okay. Uh, get hash code index uh, iterator. What are we gonna do about iterator? Iterator's got a remove method in it so if you, the, from the returned iterator. We're gonna we're gonna have to override that. Um, oh, so how, list, how would that list, how would that work? List because iterator. If start, but if you start iterating and somebody calls remove, how do you know? How do you know if you're removing uh, some? Uh, 
You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have gonna to, have to, keep, yeah, have to customer iterate you're it. You're yeah. going to have to keep track of the indexes yourself. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this isn't looking great. Okay. List iterator. Yeah. Oh, no. fun. Uh, yeah. I, do you know, do you know, you, you I think, can, I think we might have made the point. So this, this, <laughs> there's a lot of methods here. Yeah. And, and we're, many, only, we're um, not even halfway through. No, no, there's a, there's a lot more of them. To like, okay. yeah, I mean, just to go quickly, list iterator, list iterator, remove I did, remove all, remove if, remove range, replace all, uh, retain all. No, not retain all. Set. Yeah, ret yeah retain all. Retain all as well. So yeah. we're going to have to override all of these. In fact... Okay. All right, who wants to watch Morris type all of that? <laughs> <laughs> you have nothing better to do. Okay. But, but as oh, it ha oh, oh, my God. Sublist. Oh, yeah, sublist. Yeah, okay. well, so all right, all right. Right. We've, we've, we've made the point. We've made the point. We'll make the point even better because okay. he's actually done all of okay. this. Okay, how does you this know? go? <laughs> right. So one, one, that we, one that we prepared, a, or he prepared earlier. Through the magic of the internet, we just happen to have a version of a... a uh, a list with fixed first element that overrides all of the methods. And here you can see on the left hand side here you can see all the all the methods that he had to override in order in order to do that. It's pretty grim. I mean, there's a there's a lot of stuff here, and I have to say that. So so look at look at list iterator. Okay, let's look at list iterator just to show how bad it is. Right. So if you we're still in, we're still in list iterator. The yeah, th this is an inner list iterator is an inner class and th this it one. keeps track of its yeah. index yeah. and it has to override every method in order to make sure that yes, if you back up and rem attempt to remove element zero or insert before element zero, then it has to check for it that. Goes on and, and on. It, yes, it goes on, on, on and, on, and, on, and on, on. on. How many lines did you say there was an array list in the in the collection I framework? Think, uh, probably a couple thousand. I thought you said 4,000, actually. Uh, maybe 4,000. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's, there's a lot of code that you're going to have to interact with in, right. in, a, in a lot of detail if you want to uh, right. make this one simple modification. So, right, yeah. So, so what started off as a simple modification, just, just pin the first element to the beginning of the array list. And we should be able to do that by overriding a few methods here and there. No. What you've gotten into is a rat's nest of code because... If you implement a, have to implement a list from scratch by overriding all this stuff to, to, to add the checks at exactly the right places, it's really painful. And in doing so, you'll probably have to crawl through the existing code of ArrayList to make sure that the, when you call super, you're relying on its behaviors. And so what you're doing is you're exposing the subclass to what's known as the fragile base class problem. Now, you were going to explain that when I, while I was typing oh. the, the next thing. <laughs> you, need to give, you need to give me some space. I think okay. we've, we've proved that. So let's have oh, a... Okay. So, so why, don't you, why don't you tell them what the, 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 right, oh. way, the right way right. to do okay. it is? Okay, all right. So thanks for the... Re sorry, we lost our script again here. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll find it while you yeah. say what okay. the right way is. So in, okay, so, so subclassing, subclassing works, but you have to start at the right place. And so the collections framework provides a family of what are called abstract collections, abstract superclasses. So there's abstract collection, abstract list, abstract set, abstract map. Uh, and so we, we are creating a customized list. And so what we want to do is instead of starting with array list, which has all this really complicated behavior, what we do is we start instead with abstract list. And abstract list is very tightly defined. And so its behavior is specified and will not change. So if you subclass abstract list, then you're, you're, what the JDK says is abstract list behavior is not going to change, at least not very much. But, um, but it, it, it <coughs> the, what abstract list provides you is like, OK, this is a very simple list implementation that is not going to expose you to the fragile base class problem. So here, if you look in the, we, yeah, you're seeing that on the, the screen. OK, so we're looking at the Java doc for abstract list. Uh, it's, it's very simple. So to create an unmodifiable list, all you have to do is override two methods, size and get with an index. If you want to support modification, in addition, you have to uh, override um, add, set, and remove that take indexes. Shall I have a shot at that? OK. Uh, how much patience do you have? All right. Well, we'll see. <laughs> right. So I've so so here's, here's, here I've defined. I've got ready with a list with fixed first element from abstract list, and the static methods here are test methods. But I'm going to do the I'm going to do that overriding thing here, and I'm going to choose add, 
and um, so you want the ad, with, ad, with index, ad, ad yeah. with index. I want the um, the set with index. I want the get with index. I want the remove with index, and I want size. And size, unfortunately, comes from down there. And those are the those are the only thing those are the only things I have to uh, I have to override. I'm not, the red line's gone out, and now I can do that thing, of w which I which I was doing before, and I can say if I want to. Um, uh, all I need to do in this case is say uh, if index is non-zero, then return super. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to do that thing about. I wonder if this will work. Uh, let's just try it. Yeah, it did work. Okay, and same here. I can't stand this silence. Please. Please, ah. please cover me. Yeah, am I supposed to? Yeah, so yeah, what am yeah. I supposed to? Oh, that's right. So I started talking about the. I guess I should talk about the fragile base class problem. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. No, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, you've so got, you've got time. Yeah. Okay. So, so we started talking about this a little bit, but in case some of you are not familiar with this, so the fragile base class problem is something that occurs in object-oriented systems, in particular when 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 there's a sub, somebody creates a subclass and the superclass is uh, maintained by somebody else. And this is a typical thing, right? So this is the danger. If you, you know, suppose you're using a library and, and you subclass and override uh, some class in that library, when the new version of the library comes out, that superclass might have different behavior. And it's, in general, really hard to tell what behaviors you are relying on from the superclass. And so probably... This, if the superclass changes behavior, it might break your, your program. Now, I don't know why it's called the fragile base class problem. I mean, it should be called the fragile subclass problem, but because it's the subclass that ends up breaking. But, uh, but anyway, uh, so that's typically what it's, what's, uh, how, how, it's, how it's manifested. Uh, we do have this problem in the JDK, uh, and it has been a problem over time. Um, as, uh, in particular, the kinds of behaviors that people rely on is what is called self-use or self-calls. So um, <clears throat> consider, consider the add-all method. The easiest way to, to, uh, to implement add-all is to just loop over the collection that's an argument and then just call add. So what that might, so, so suppose, and in fact, early versions of of the JDK, like probably, I'm not sure if, what, if you have to go back, back to like JDK 5 or 6 or something like that, or maybe even earlier, earlier versions of the JDK actually did this. And so if you wanted to change the behavior of ArrayList, you'd subclass it, and all you had to do was override the add method, and that would take care of add all as well. But then when the later JDKs came out, ArrayList had an optimized add all that said, oh, okay, well, what I have to do is just, is just take you know, take the existing collection and insert it in directly into the right place in the array instead of calling add repeatedly. And what that did is that was faster, but it broke the subclasses. So that's the problem with that. Now, the way that the abstract list approach avoids this is it's defined that all of those other methods and the iterators and the sublist and all that kind of stuff are all implemented in terms of those methods that Morris is busy overriding right now. So in fact, add all is implemented that way. It, it's implemented in terms of add with an index. So when you override add with index, then everything goes through that. Now, what will happen is you'll get a, f you can get a fully functioning list uh, pretty quickly by just overriding a few methods. Now, they might not do exactly what you want to do, so you might have to do some additional overriding, but the fact is that list is actually a pretty complicated interface. And if you think about implementing list iterator, if you think about implementing um, sublist, if you think about implementing reversed, which is new in JDK 21, there's a lot of stuff going on. And if you had to implement that from scratch, that's a lot. But abstract list takes all of that whole rich interface and funnels everything down to these five methods, or fewer if you, if you want a read-only method, a read-only list. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the point of using abstract list and subclassing from abstract list instead of trying to take one of these full-fledged collections like ArrayList and modifying its behavior through selective overriding. All right, so how are we doing over here, Morris? I'm not sure. Uh, I, think, I think it might be right, but I don't know. Let's, let's try running okay. and see what happens. Oh, 
Oh, Reedy's 21, oh, not supported. Uh, uh, I don't know what that's about. Uh, <laughs> I thought we'd got. I thought we'd fix this problem. Uh, so, uh, what was what was this one? Um, this was the this was this the run problem? I forget. Uh, we, no, should, we, 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 have, we have these problems, don't we? It it's might be the run problem, and it might not. Anyway, I think, I think, I think I've got it right. Yeah. So, I, so, so this is my constructor. Is that right? I've, um, I've, I'm delegating to an array list. Right, yeah. So the, implement, the common implementation technique here is that when you, um, you can certainly use array list in your abstract list subclass. In fact, that's often the easiest way to do it. Which is you can um, <clears throat> you can have you can have array list do all the heavy lifting of allocating the array and shuffling things around and tracking the right indexes and stuff. But this is this is another this is another example of um, what is it prefer composition to inheritance. So instead of inheriting and overriding from array list, you you start with the skeletal implementation in abstract list and then delegate calls to ArrayList to get the actual work done. But then what that does is everything goes through your subclass, and so you have total control over what's going on there. And ArrayList, and, what you, and the way you're depending on ArrayList in that, in that case is as a regular client, as opposed to a subclasser. And so that's, you're, much on, you're on much safer ground in doing so. All right, so why don't we take a look at the code? Um, well, we, can, we can take a look at the code. I've still, uh, there's, there's still, yeah. That's always a problem, but... Um, the code, I think, is probably okay. So, I mean, it's pretty pretty mechanical. Right. I, d d yeah. So I, for each for each method, all I need to do. Yeah. Sorry, so go ahead. Yeah. So we started. Okay. So we so we have a backing list, and then we initialize that to an array list, and then we add the fixed element at the at the first position, and then okay. So that's our that's our initial case, and then yeah. So set. Uh, you know, I, checks its index. Yep. Um, so that prevents the first element from being changed. Add checks its index again. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, remove. Yeah, it's basically the same. It's right? Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, I mean, okay. they're, they're all the same. Okay. Except for getting size and getting yeah. size just delegate. Yeah. So so basically we're done, and it's much less code and it has much uh, much higher assurance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the fact that we can't get it to work is a completely different matter. Yeah. So. Um, so the fact is, though, that this fragile base class problem is a, is a continuing and ongoing problem. So, so why don't you bring back the um, uh, uh, the that that no the large uh, superclass that oh that I right wrote. yeah yeah so have, have a look at this. and actually what is yeah. there anything else in here that we um, well I'll, I'll, why don't you do I'll, that? I'll check but here's the um, here's the list with fixed first element and in fact in this case I, since I've switched to JDK twenty one. You can see that even if you'd have even even you have who who got this thing, and that's probably what what's what's going wrong now, because um, we now have, we should have, um, yeah. yeah, we've got get first and well, well more to the point, we've got remove first and remove last, and right. you, you only implemented this thing for JDK seventeen, you, right, yeah, so so, <laughs> if you had. Okay, so again, go back to this, you know, the, 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 uh, the approach that we we're criticizing, which is to take array list, subclass it, and start overriding methods until you get the result you want. That will work eventually after you've written all that code, but then when the next JDK comes out, it can be broken not only because of changes in behavior, but because we might add new methods, right? So for instance, remove first, I happen, since I implemented it, I happen to know that remove first on array list goes directly into the array and, um, and, and does its array manipulations. It does not go through any other remove methods that might have been overridden. So that code that I wrote would work on JDK 17, but it would be broken on JDK 21 because new methods have appeared that break its invariants. Uh, and what are, your, and what are your plans for JDK 25? That's ah, to, yeah. Don't you want to know? <laughs> so. However, in, in abstract list, abstract list funnels all of those methods into the five overrides. And so for remove first in particular gets translated into a call to remove, remove int comma, or remove int. And so, so that will work with the version that Morris typed in. Because, and so that's the, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the guarantee that abstract list provides you. Cool.
I think we are, uh, we've proved uh, as whatever point we can do yeah. about, about custom collections. Right, yeah. And so it happens to be the exact very time. Is it? Oh, very good. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah, so that's the idea. If you want to create a customized collection, don't subclass the concrete concrete classes from uh, the JDK because you will get yourself into trouble. Start with the abstract collections like abstract list, abstract map, etc. And if you read the Java doc, they have instructions in there about exactly the methods you need to override. Okay. Right. So, so yeah. Yep. So 75 minutes in. Exactly. And it is break time. So yeah. So we'll okay. see you see you in a half an hour. Well, hope hopefully see you in yeah. half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Looks like we're back. First of all, thank you very much for coming back. Yes. All right. Uh, okay. So we uh, we're gonna start the second part with uh, revisiting a few minor issues and some people came up with interesting questions and we wanted to share the questions and answers with you since I think there's some interesting lessons in this. So we're gonna do a quick run. No, we're not gonna run through the thing. We're gonna we're gonna zip through some of the material we covered in the first half. So let's see. So where? Okay. Establish ownership. Okay. Um, what would you like? So just. Go start going forward. Ah, there. Okay. It it never fails, right? This is my f this this was the first attempt at saying okay. Now we've encapsulated our collection because we're n we're we're keeping the collection private and we're not exposing it. Of course, while I was describing this to you, I saw a bug, and I'm I, I'm surprised that uh, Remy didn't point it out. <laughs> uh, the bug is it's exposing an iterator. An iterator is mutable, which is, I understand why it's there, but it's also kind of a misfeature. Um, and so uh, what this does is uh, if the client gets its hands on an iterator, it, call, it can call remove on any element without control of, uh, without the node class getting control. So in fact, in this code, the client can in fact remove the, the, uh, all of the, uh, the elements, or the edges. So, um, oh well. Uh, so that's just something you have to watch out for. Okay, a couple other things. Um, yeah, why don't you run run through until we find the... Oh, let's see, was that the go back one? Uh, no, the one where we, I, want, I want the one where the constructor makes a copy. Okay, uh, coming up. Yeah, a little f couple, couple more slides. Oh, oh. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So somebody asked about this, and this is a, this is a subtlety here. And uh, um, you might think, okay, well, you should. The kind of the typical thing to do in checking invariants is you check arguments and then make assignments to fields. Uh, and so here you'll notice that the constructor is making a copy, and then checking the copy. And really, what it should do is make a copy and store it in a local variable then check the copy, and then store the local variable into the field. But I think the main thing is this makes a copy before doing the check. And the reason for that is whether or not this cl class is or is not thread safe, it's possible that the collection that's being passed in might be thread safe and be concurrently modified. So suppose we checked for empty, and then finding it not empty, we made the copy. The collection that was passed in could have changed after the check, but before we made the copy. So this is a, a, a particular class of error called time of check time of, versus time of use error, or talk tau, or however you, want to, however you want to pronounce that. I can just call it check then act. Yeah, I guess so. But I think talk tau is a, a little more evocative because I, I think to me that means exact, precisely a potential concurrent mm -hmm. modification. Um, but, uh, but actually, no. I mean, here we're sort of acting then checking. Yeah. We're making the copy first. And then since we have made the copy, we know it is stable. And then we are checking our invariant over it mm -hmm. and then throwing the exception. So, so it turns out that uh, there are... You know, it's actually, you have to think really carefully about this. In fact, people, f people constantly find, constantly. I mean, it's a recurring source of bugs in the JDK where somebody can break one of the invariants of, of some pretty fundamental classes by, by passing something in and modifying it concurrently. And so it gets into a race with checking that's been done in the JDK. So this is a real issue. 
Uh, and, it, and I mean, so it can lead to bugs, but it can also lead to security holes. So that's something to watch out for. Okay, um, so I got that and that. So why don't we proceed to uh, the summary probably? Oh, right there. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so I, I don't want to go over all this before, but there are some, some rules here about making defensive copies and wrapping in unmodifiable wrappers. Um, on the one hand, maybe you've heard all of this before and we didn't need to go through all this, um, but I've been surprised by some code that I've seen in the field where people actually get this wrong. Right. And in fact, I did see some code in, that was actually in the JDK where a collection was being passed into an object and the, the, the object that received the collection wrapped it in an unmodifiable wrapper and then stored it in the field. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Just in case you accidentally yeah. shoot so, yourself in the foot. So, so the fact is that I, you know, I thought it was worth going over this and then writing these simple rules of make defensive copies of input and wrap wrap unmodifiable wrappers when, when, when sending things outbound. Uh, because sometimes people get that wrong. And so this yeah. is, these are the rules, but this is, these are the rules we're, 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 or guidelines really we're proposing. But also I think what we went through is the rationale for doing it th in that particular way. And the fact is in the field, people actually get this wrong. So I, think our, I hope that our effort in describing this will help people uh, get that right more often. Okay. okay. Um, and then uh, one more thing about the abstract. Uh, I don't know if we have a slide for that. Which? What? Uh, basically, it's about performance of the abstract. Uh, actually, why don't you bring up the Java doc? We still have that. We do. Yeah. I right. Guess. Okay. So um, actually, well, this is not necessarily the uh, the best example of this. But if you, uh, I don't know if you want to, you want to. you like? What would you like? Why don't you bring up abstract set? Okay. So abstract list is interesting because it's kind of the easiest to understand oh. because... Oh, yeah, I've looked. Oh. <laughs> no. Well, I can try, I can try get, get a connection, but you can... Uh, you, are, uh, I, okay, yeah, never mind. No, all right, no. so, so I'll, just, I'll just hand wave it. If you go, go and look up abstract set. So what's interesting... Okay, so abstract list is probably the easiest to understand because everything is index-based and everybody understands that lists are index-based. And so the methods that you need to override with the exception of size, all of the others, you know, what do we say? Get, add, set, and remove are all index-based. So it turns out there's the, the other abstract lists are a little harder to get, sorry, the other abstract classes in the collections framework are a little harder to get your head around. Um, there's abstract sequential list and abstract set and abstract map and abstract collection, and they are all iterator-based. And so um, I got a... a, a uh, a very, you know, somebody came up uh, during the break and asked a very good question, which is, well, what are the performance implications of using these in particular? And so my example was, suppose you created an abstract set. Typically, you want something like a, co a contains check on a set to be order constant. And so if you have a hash set, that does a hash, and then it, you know, finds it very quickly or not. And so that's order constant. But if you create something based on an abstract set, every operation, by default, is based on an iterator. So, so in an abstract set, the, the, um, the, the main abstract collection and abstract set, the main method you need to override is iterator, whose responsibility is to return an iterator. And so all of the other methods are based on an iterator. So to do a contains check on an abstract set, if all you do is override that one, what it does, it gets an iterator and it says, okay, get the next element, you know, supposing doing, you know, contain, you know, does this contain element E? Okay, get the next element. Does it equal E? Get the next element. Does it equal E? Right. So basically, goes through every element in the set until it finds one that uh, that equals and returns true. Otherwise, it gets to the end and returns false. And so clearly, order uh, the contains check on a very simplistic abstract set is order n, and <clears throat> that might be okay depending on what you're doing. But if you are concerned about performance, then it uh, depends on how you're implementing it. But if we use the same technique there where you have an abstract set that has, a, that has something like a hash set as its backing set, then you can do things like override contains and then just delegate it immediately. And then you get back your, your order constant performance. Cool. Okay. 
All right, and I think that's the things that, that I want to talk about. Awesome. Okay, right. And then you so, had. Oh yeah. So I mean, one I, more, one more very I, important. I, I have piece almost of slide. Oh yeah. I wanted to tell you that the reason that um, the reason that my um, I mm. couldn't I couldn't get my my thing to work was because I'd excluded it from uh, from compilation because it was uh, abstract to start off with, and I wanted to I wanted to show um, uh, Stuart's um, Stuart's class. Without, without it, uh, and, and, and allowing it to build properly, without a, a, a class that wasn't compiling. So when I included it in the compilation, it ran. Well, it's not very impressive anyway. There's, there's a, there's a test that, um, there's a test that just makes sure that it's always going to, um, uh, that that it's always yeah. going, it's always going to, not remove the, uh, the, the the fixed the fixed element. So it's not, it's so, not, so it's not really terribly exciting. Yeah. But go up to the top of the uh, output there. Right. No, uh, the top of the output. Top of the output, right, yeah. okay. Uh, so the original list is 999, which is our special fixed first element, right. and two, three, and four, right? And so if we attempt to add, add at index zero, that throws an exception, and if we add at one, that, that works, works. works just fine. And, and then clear throws an exception, uh, and so on. So it's like, yeah, it worked, is, is, is the short version, even though I couldn't get it to compile because I'd excluded it from compilation. Right, so that was all. Okay, just, well, just, there's one more important piece there's of one, guidance. Oh, yeah, that's right. One more, one more very important piece of guidance, which I managed to forget when, um, I don't know how I forgot it. The most important piece of guidance um, in, the, uh, the, in part B, that one. <laughs> <laughs> When you finally can, that is. <laughs> right. And, uh, real soon now. Okay, so that's, um, that, that's us with guidance. And now we are going to talk about controversies in the Java Collections Framework. And the first and biggest controversy, which is like, r comes up over and over again, is the question about optional methods and unsupported operation exception. So we've already given this quite an outing today, but we're not done. So here's a, uh, a quote from uh, one of the reviewers of the proposal for the second edition. Um, so the, oh, the second the, edition of your book. Second, right? edi second yeah. edition of the sorry, second edition of uh, Java Generics and Collections. So the reviewer said even the modest editions, such as Immutable Collections, are hamstrung by the requirement to implement the mutation methods of the collections APIs. And this was a quite and this was actually a very favourable review. It said yeah, you, you, this book wants to be written. It adds, just throwing unsupported operation exception is a horrible hack, to put it politely. The immutability of Java's new collections, talking about the Java 9 collections, uh, list of, set of, map of, is not visible at type level at all. And this reflects a basic incompatibility between the now over 20, oops, sorry, excuse me, between the now over 20 year old and highly imperative design of the collections and the current trend towards a more functional programming style. So this is a kind of common opinion about unsupported operation exception and the, option, and the optional methods. So we thought, well, let's think about, so the idea was, let's think about what we could possibly, what could possibly have been done differently and how could the collections API be designed in a way that doesn't have, doesn't have this problem and has the things that people want and most obviously immutability. I mean, this is what this reviewer is, 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 is aiming at. He's, He's unhappy about the fact that there's just no reflection of immutability in the, in, in the type structure. So we had to think about this. And w one of the things that we did was we went back to the, uh, the original motivation for, uh, for doing things in the way that they are, which is actually still in the Java doc for Java Util. Uh, Java Util. Yeah, the, right. the, the, collection, mm -hmm. the Collections API. This is written by Joshua Bloch, who's the original author of the Java Collections Framework. And, and it says, why don't you support immutability directly in the core collection interfaces so that you can do away with optional operations and unsupported operation exception? And, the, and his answer was, and this is his motivation for, do, for uh, designing it this way, most controversial design decision in the whole API, clearly static type checking, highly desirable, and the norm in Java. We would have supported it if we, if we believed it was, was feasible. Unfortunately, attempts to achieve this goal cause an explosion in the size of the interface hierarchy and do not succeed in, and, and do not succeed in eliminating the need for runtime exceptions. So there's two things there. One of them is the explosion in the size of the hierarchy, and the other one is doesn't work anyway. 
right? And those are those are those are actually different, right? Yeah. So they're, yeah, uh, <laughs> you can do you can well. Go. They're different, uh, but it, I, I think, but it does open this question about how much. Well, we're sort of getting ahead, but how, yeah. how much? Yeah, don't get ahead. How much? How much is proper to represent in the type hierarchy? How much is possible to represent in, the, in yeah. the type hierarchy? So, I mean, so one thing that we'll say straight away is that the frameworks that have tried to, that do reflect this to some extent, are a great deal larger than the Collections API. So the Java Collections API has, I can't remember what it's like, something like about 30 types the last time I counted, mm -hmm. roughly, something like that. And, these, and, and the other frameworks that we're going to uh, refer to here have hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of types. You simply can't, and, and the basic motivation that, that uh, Bloch, Joshua Bloch is referring to here was the idea that the Collections API was going to be an everyday tool, tool for the everyday programmer. Java is a blue-collar language, and we want people to be able to get their heads around a reasonable-sized type, uh, type hierarchy. So we're going to look at the possibilities here, but you want to bear in mind that all the possibilities that we have here are going to lead to a big increase in the size of the type hierarchy. And in those days, remember, they didn't have what now some of these frameworks depend on, which are integrated development environments that actually are hugely important in helping a developer to find the type they're looking for. You just had to, you just had to know about them in 1998. So that was, so that was a big difference. Okay. Right. I mean, that's enough of a, uh, a prelude. What would immutable types achieve? So we've got two possibilities here. Mm -hmm. I think you do this. Okay. All right, so the first is, uh, and I think this, the, the, the reviewer of the, uh, the, the proposal, which we, who we quoted in the, uh, the earlier slide, was saying, oh, this is a horrible hack. And to me, that looks like a reaction to what I will refer to as structural aspects of the interface hierarchy. Um, and so basically, what we have is we have an interface, say, the collection interface, and there are certain methods that are, that are specified to be optional and implementations of the collection interface are allowed to throw exceptions. And so on the surface of this, well, actually, it's more than on the surface. I think there's, there's a, a fairly well-known object design principle called the interface segregation principle, or the ISP. It says, OK, well, if you, have, if you have functions like this where some things implemented and some things don't, then those should be in a separate interface. And, and kind of on the surface, that makes sense. Uh, but that's a structural aspect of the type hierarchy. So we're saying, so what that leads to is a, a line of reasoning where we could say, okay, we have this interface. It needs to be split apart somehow to say, okay, the, the, uh, some methods, the ones that are optional, should be over here in the separate interface. And only if, uh, if uh, an implementation supports those operations should it actually implement that interface. And everything else should support the, the regular ones. And you know that makes, that makes sense, right? Because it's much easier if you're looking at something to say, OK, why does this have a method on here that I can call, but that just throws me an exception, right? Why not just, that should just not be present in the first place. And so that does make a certain amount of sense. Um, in particular, I think the, the most obvious division is to separate out the read-write, or the, what we're calling the mutator methods, from the read-only ones. But it's a little more than that. And it, the question is, what are you trying to achieve by s doing the separation? And so what some people are saying is, OK, well, what we want to do is, is <clears throat> um, it, it, some people are concerned mostly about you know, read-only collections versus read-write collections. But other people are concerned about, well, optional methods are simply bad design and should be eradicated. But the problem is there are a bunch of special cases that are not read-write and not read-only, right? So earlier in the presentation, we talked about certain things, certain views had restricted operations on them. So for instance, arrays.aslist supports set, so it is mutable. It's read-write but it doesn't support add or remove. Or key set, we also went through. A key set, things can be removed from, uh, uh, yeah, things can be removed from a key set, that's mutation, but they cannot be added. So if you really want to get rid of all of the, uh, all of the optional methods and get rid of unsupported operation exception, then maybe you have to break your interfaces into smaller pieces than just read only and read write. 
Uh, maybe you need fixed size list to say, oh, there's no add and remove operations, but there's just a set operation. Or maybe you have remove only set, which cannot be added to, but it can be removed from. And now you, you're going to get to the yeah. You're liable to get to the point where you've got a custom yeah. interface for every implementation, and these and, and although actually, yeah. although actually Stuart knows that there are a lot of irregularities yes. in the way that the views work, and sometimes it's really quite hard to know which yeah. operations are supported and which aren't. In some of them, and the, these these are good examples. It's like if you want a view of an array as though it were a list, which is a thing to want. I mean, it's a very logical thing to want. Then it's just going to have that restriction that it's fixed size. So are you going to design a, an interface specially for that? Right. Because that's what you would have to do if you don't want to have yeah. unsupported operation exception. Right. And so, so, so I think some people's reaction to this is, oh, well, those special cases, we don't need to worry about those. The main thing is separating read-write from read-only. Oh, and, that, and that's, well, hang on a second. No. So, so, and, that's, and that's fair. But then there are other people who say, well, no, we really need to eradicate optional methods because those are just wrong. And what that does is it raises this question of what are you really trying to achieve? Right. Okay. And notice that all of this has been about the structure of the interfaces. So once you right. advance there. So, what's the, and so what do you really want to talk about? I think that this whole argument about the structure is mostly a distraction because what we really want to do is talk about semantics. What meaning are we trying to ascribe to an, uh, these interfaces that we create? Do we want, uh, if we expose a new interface, we should tell programmers, you should use this in this circumstance because this is what it means, as opposed to saying, oh, yes, well, we need a remove-only interface because there's this collection over here that only supports removal, right? Well, so, okay. So, in fact, if you... If you look at a method, if you look, if if you were to take a method and and make it be sort of read only in some sense, there are actually a bunch of different meanings from that, and and those meanings can come out in different contexts. And which meaning, which which meaning you choose to implement, depends on what you're trying to achieve. And these aren't necessarily right or wrong, but some people value some more than than others but they are different. And so we should be talking about this from a semantic point of view. In particular, one, suppose, you have, suppose you have a collection interface that only supports reading, um, and you hand that to somebody. What are you telling them? Maybe you're telling them, OK, there's some data here, and you shouldn't mutate it, but you can if you, for instance, downcast. Or another thing is, here's an instance of this interface, and you cannot mutate it. You cannot mutate it, but other people can, or but other classes can. So you can't rely on it. Yeah. Well, be, right, being, so, being unmodified. Yeah. Or there's there is still another thing, which is here is an instance of a read-only collection, and nobody can can mutate it, which means that you can rely on it never changing. And so so when you receive an instance of such an interface. You have to understand what the meaning is behind that interface, not just its structure. Uh, so in particular, if no one can mutate the data, then, then what you can do is you can, store a, you can just store that reference, and you don't have to make a defensive copy. But if somebody else can mutate it, regardless of whether it's read-only or not to you, if somebody else can mutate it, if you want to have a stable representation, then you do need to make a defensive copy. And so, for instance, the behavior that you wrap around the use of, of an interface with the same structure is markedly different depending on what that interface means. Right. So with this preamble, let's have a look at what the possibilities are about how immutability could have been, fit, could have been part of the type structure, or let's say immutability could have been part of the type structure of the collections framework. And more or less how it's been done in other frameworks, and we're thinking about Guava, we're thinking about the Eclipse collections, and we're thinking about Kotlin. So those, those, have, all done it, those have all done it differently, and they've all tried to get in some more element of, um, of immutability than the, than the Java collections API tries to do. So the first one is, the first possibility, which you often see on uh, 
mind, fairly mindless blog posts is well, not blog posts or, or posts or posts on um, the Reddit. discussion on the discussion forum that we mustn't mention because Reddit. Stuart reads it too much. <laughs> <laughs> people on Reddit don't always think very carefully about what they're writing. And I've seen people say, oh, why don't they just add in an immutable supertype? Right, like that. So, so we, we, we add immutable collections, and then we, then we have mutable collections that, uh, that uh, subclass from, that subclass from, extend them. So, uh, so I've renamed, we've renamed them on this diagram here. But actually, you could have Java Util Collection could be in the middle, and you could just add on an immutable collection uh, above that. So an immutable collection doesn't have mutator methods on it. And similarly for immutable set and, Im and immutable list. What could possibly be wrong with that? <laughs> yeah. Well, so one thing is, so, so, so array list would presumably extend mutable list, uh -huh. but, but by, ex by extension, it also extends immutable list. So array list is an immutable list. And, uh, and that's, that's basically wrong. That's not usually what, what, how you think about the meaning of yeah. subtyping. We usually think that a, that a subtype is a kind of right. thing of the, of the, of the supertype. So, so that, is, that, is, that is one possibility. And we could rename immutable, the immutable things to read only. Right. OK. And so this is really interesting, because what we've done is we said, OK, here's the structure that we want. And now we're using the structure to drive the semantics into the library. And you know, as a library designer, I think that's wrong. Uh, you usually get yourself into trouble that way. Uh, and so I think that's a trap that people often fall into, which is that they're trying to retrofit semantics onto the structure they think is, you know, is cleaner in some sense. OK. So you will notice straight away that here's an example where we've taken this very, this very simple, I mean, this, this is actually the basis of the collections API. And now we've doubled the number of types. But in, that it, with this hypothetical, with this hypothetical extension, but doubling them actually is the least least of our problems in general. So another possibility, a second mm. possibility, would be to have separate p parallel hierarchies, just completely, just completely separate. And this is how the Eclipse collections mm -hmm. d uh, do it, oh, except they have, um, sorry, excuse me, they have a lot more of, um, they have many, 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 many types. So this is the one with thousands of types. Um, so the problem with this is, I mean, the, the good thing about this is that uh, um, uh, an unmodifiable view of a mutable collection, it naturally translates into being a, 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 an immutable collection. But the bad news about it is that you may find yourself spending a lot of time interconverting between the two hierarchies, and you're actually going to have to have conversion methods between, mm -hmm. between them. Right. Um, but also, again, there's some semantic issues here, because if you have an immutable collection, is it really immutable if it's just a wrapper, right? So if there's a mutable collection backing in it and somebody else can modify it, then what's called an immutable collection is not actually immutable. So we again have this naming problem, we have a semantic problem. Um, and so I think which, which you choose, again, depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and there's, there's another axis of design here, which is if you really want the collections to be immutable, then the library that implements these, and uh, I think, I don't think, I don't know if Eclipse Collections has unmodifiable wrappers, but I think in Eclipse Collections and in some other, uh, some other libraries, if something is labeled immutable, well, I would call it unmodifiable, but in fact, nobody can change it. So it's not an unmodifiable view. But interfaces in general are open to extension and implementation by anybody. So somebody else could come along, take immutable collection, create an implementation of it that adds mutator methods, and now your immutable collection is suddenly mutable again. So do you want assurance that that cannot happen, or are you going to trust any implementers to obey the contract. I've got an idea. OK. Why don't we make these sealed interfaces? Right? Well, that's an excellent idea, right? Because you can do that, right? So that's a new language feature in, in uh, I forget which JDK. It was a fairly recent. Actually, 20, uh, 21? No, 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 no. 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 Seal, uh, uh, fairly recently, uh, sealed, sealed classes and interfaces became a thing. So, so uh, he, um, <clears throat> The uh, interfaces can declare 
who is permitted to implement them. There's actually a new permits keyword in the interface declaration. And so what that does is it closes off extensibility in order to gain higher assurance. And so within a library, you can expose an interface, but you can be confident that nobody, nobody outside the library can provide a, kind of an adversarial implementation that, that does things that you did not intend to do. Um, and so, uh, but some people don't like that because they want to be able to, uh, um, and both, on both sides, either the client side and the library side. Library authors sometimes do want to provide extensibility, but you give up some measure of assurance if you, if you allow for public extensibility. So speaking as a representative of the client programmers here, yes. <laughs> I'm not all that happy with uh, sealed interfaces because, hey, you know, like I'm tied to whatever the library has provided. And maybe, uh, maybe I want to write a, 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 an array list with a fix, oh, sorry, a list with a fixed first element. I'm very keen on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see how good I am at doing it as well. <laughs> so that's the parallel hierarchy. Right. And, okay. th and a third possibility is the opposite of the first one. So in the, so to the first one, we added immutable supertypes. And, and in the third one, we added immutable subtypes. So the diagram looks very similar, except it's upside down. So here we, we uh, subclass from the mutable collection. And, and we have, a, a, as you can see, subclasses of every, of every one of the, 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 the interfaces with an immutable version. Mm -hmm. So what do we think about this? OK, so this, so uh, Guava is an example of a library that does something like this. Um, they effectively have immutable collection classes. And uh, basically, they created classes and have private constructors uh, because Guava is based on an older version of the JDK. But if, if they were to, I, I believe if they were to re-implement this on top of the latest JDK, they would simply use sealed classes. Because what they, Guava has taken the approach here that they, they want high assurance in that any object that has immutable in the type name is only implemented by Guava and is, in fact, immutable or unmodifiable. Um, and so they do not allow extensibility of these. Um, and so, but also in order to facilitate interoperability with the rest of the world, which uses kind of Java Util collection as, uh, as the general means to pass around aggregates of objects, they've created these as subtypes of collection. And so you get, so it seems strange because you, you get this upside down inheritance where the, the, the higher level types have all the mutator methods and the, the subtypes well, they inherit all the mutator methods and they explicitly reject them, right? So they throw unsupported operation exception. So, so you, you still have the, so, so what, what the trade-off here is that they have decided not to solve or not to try to solve the optional, uh, yeah, the optional methods and unsupported operation exception problem in order to gain high assurance that an immutable collection is in fact immutable. And once again, by the way, you'll notice that we've got a proliferation of interfaces right. here. Now, in, a, in every one of these cases, we've got a lot more than we have, have in the Java collection framework. So approach number four is quite interesting. And by the way, it's the last one. This, this is Kotlin, which actually is in two halves. So there's Kotlin and there's Kotlin, right. and there's Kotlin X, which is like the extension Kotlin. Go ahead. You do. Yeah. Okay. So Kotlin.collections is part of the standard Kotlin library, and then Kotlinx.collections is a proposal for augmenting it. I don't know. I, I don't follow Kotlin development that closely, but the Kotlinx stuff is sort of you know unofficial prototyping kind of proposed standard stuff. I don't know where they are in the track for that, but but if you combine these, then you actually get uh, a variety of different semantics. Um, so, so one is, uh, so, so another thing is Kotlin has started over with its class libraries. So, so they had the advantage of being able to rename these. So you don't have this, this problem of the top type being called immutable and mis being misleadingly so, right? So, um, so most of your standard collections like ArrayList and HashSet in Kotlin are instances of mutable collection. And then the super type is simply collection and it lacks the mutator methods. So, so that's kind of nice there because if you pass collections around in general um, in Kotlin, if you pass just a, you know, you know kotlin.collections.collection around, then that's implicitly offering only read access. 
But more importantly, it doesn't tell you whether somebody else can, it doesn't tell you what the underlying thing is. Um, you can, in some cases, you can actually downcast that to something mutable. In other cases, you cannot, but you can't tell whether somebody has a mutable reference to what's underneath it. So you have the problem, the same problem with views. You can't tell whether it's actually unmodifiable or merely an unmodifiable view. Um, but that's kind of nice because, um, you know, they, they mostly avoid the optional methods problem. Um, and then, um, but there are additional semantics that you might also want to support, and that's what the Kotlin X collections proposal is about. Um, so they have an immutable family of types, which are basically by specification, say, they, they inherit mostly the same API, which has read-only methods, and they do not have any mutators, but they add additional uh, uh, specification words that say these you know, instances of these types are in fact immutable. So that, does, that avoids the you know, ambiguity over whether it's uh, a view onto something that's mutable or, or, or not. Um, and then as subtypes of those, they've introduced another new semantic, which we have not talked about yet, which is to add this notion of persistence a persistent collection. So, so this is persistence in a different sense. It's not storing collections in a database. Rather, it's exposing what look like mutator methods on the collection, but when you, when, when you call one of these uh, methods, it doesn't modify the collection in place. What it does is essentially creates a new edition of the collection. And so there's a lot of functional programming and data structures that are considered persistent in that way. Because if you have, if you have a copy of some collection and somebody calls a, modify, a modification method on it, that creates conceptually a new collection, but the old editions of the collection persist as long as anybody has reference to them. And so conceptually, this is sort of copy on write, but the idea of these data structures is, is that they do structural sharing in a safe fashion so that they need to only need to do minimal copying when somebody creates, um, uh, when somebody creates a new edition of the collection. So that sounds like a really good idea. Could we have those in the Java Collections framework, please? Patience, please. <laughs> no, you, you know how old I am. Yes. I, I'm not gonna, I, don't, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> okay. Well, well, the, no, we're still, we're still not done. Oh, no, one, yeah, one more thing about this. Right, okay, so, one, so one, I, one more. Well, but back to the Kotlin, yes, okay. So, so I think this is very interesting. So, but notice what's going on here. In the previous diagrams, we had collection, list, and set, uh, and there are a couple others. And so here, we only are talking about collection. Mm. And so in, yeah. in, in Kotlin, you could imagine that when, when the, if, this, if this were completely built out, they would have, I, I don't know what all of the, the uh, Kotlin does not have exactly the same set of interfaces as Java collections do, but they, they do have others. There's list and set and maybe sorted set, I'm not sure. Um, but um, you, you have to imagine that this set of four interfaces is now multiplied by the number of actually, actual different interface types in Kotlin. They certainly have set and list and maybe others, and so this will be multiplied. So again, we have, pro, uh, we have uh, proliferation of, of types here, um, but even in a greater scale than the previous, than the previous slides, because yeah. there, are more different there, there are more different semantics that they are, are uh, wanting to encode in the type system, so, so they essentially are having kind of a, a cross-product effect, which is you have know, different kinds of collections and they have different kinds of you know, read-only, immutable, persistent. Um, and so you end up, you start to end up with like the cross product of these different characteristics. Okay. So, so the time problem that we had, we now have the opposite problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so the original design considerations, I showed you, I showed you that, that um, uh, the Java doc that uh, Josh Bach wrote, and he was, co he was concerned about two things. He was concerned, primarily he was concerned about proliferation. Well, we've talked about that quite a lot. He was also concerned about the type system being unsuitable for expressing some behaviours. And we've also talked about things like key set and, um, and arrays dot as list and so on. So the, it doesn't look like the type system is the right way of talking about those, re those restrictions. It doesn't, it doesn't appear to be. So what could you do? I mean, so we often get this thing about, well, you know, Java should 
including yeah, usability. When, when, when are we going to fix this unsupported operation exception? That's, that's right, yeah. It's, it's uh, unsupported operation exception is a bug. When are we going to... Um, uh, when are we going to fix it? So, well, if, supposing we weren't constrained by the dead hand of the past, which I'm not sure Josh really wants <laughs> to be referred to as the dead hand of the past, because he's very much not dead. But it, but uh, we've got that we got the history of that. But the original considerations would still apply, and the question we should be asking is not what would be the structural changes that would be made that would regularize things because i think what we've seen in the in the the proposals that we've looked at there is that the that you're not going to get the structure right in this in in, in the sense that it's really clean and uh, there are no there are no kind of weirdnesses about it whether we have we don't have a ray list uh, being a being an immutable list or, or whatever so you're not going to get it right in that sense the question really is what do you want to achieve so what are the semantics that would justify making making the changes or or the additions or a kind of or a new um, or, or a completely new type structure. And I think that question is one that is not right. actually often asked. Right. And so so I think there's this idea which is doing any work of this nature is inevitably going to add essentially another uh, another either another layer or another separate hierarchy of types, and that's a big deal. And so if we do that in the JDK, we ought to be getting a lot for it. And so we could add a whole new set of types that you know, solve the optional methods problem and satisfy somebody's design sensibilities. Or we could say, let's add a whole new hierarchy of types with different APIs in order to support persistent collections. And that, to me, sounds like a, a lot more valuable. Hmm. And we really probably only have the budget to do like one new collections hierarchy, right? So I'm not going to add. I, I do not think it is worthwhile to add like four different collections hierarchies to support unmodifiable, unmodifiable views, read-only views, persistent collections views, right? So we have to choose very wisely there. And so we need to choose semantics that have extremely high value for the cost of adding an entire hierarchy. So this doesn't sound. I'm sorry, we haven't actually managed to have a controversy here. <laughs> We're in agreement about that. So that's kind of covered some of the, well, that's, that's covered some of the ground, I think, about the um, uh, about the the this problem, which is often just kind of referred to as like a wart right. on the on on, right. on the on the collections API, and you can see it is a problem ish. But you can also see that it's not a simple one to fix, and it's not just a mistake that somebody made to, to, to make it like that. Okay, so our second controversy is about set membership semantics, because quite often we get this thing, am I supposed to do a, a demo here? I think I, I, think I am soon, uh, but am I supposed to do it yet? I'm so, not sure. Uh, at some point, yeah. At, at some point, yeah. So. Um, so the, the problem that people often come across and say, wow, this is just wrong, is the effect of what happens if you put two objects into a sorted set for which the comparison method returns zero. So, like you, so you've got a comparator on, on, on two objects, and they just disappear when you put them into a, a sorted set. Sorted sets are really useful. I think they're often underestimated in, right. in, in the API. I mean, I really like using them, and I find them really good. But it's a pain, and th this, this problem is a pain, and it's kind of not entirely clear what it's about. And it's not very well understood. And in fact, the Java doc is incredibly misleading about, about this. It's, it's not so, I, so I've, I've defended, I've defended the uh, uh, Joshua Bloch uh, in, the, in the last controversy, and I'm going to criticize him a yeah. lot in this one, because it often says that, that um, uh, set comparison, uh, that comparison methods should be consistent with equals. What does exactly does that mean? Well, let's have a look at it. When do I get, my, when do I get to do my demo here? Yeah, I, so think I'm, I think I probably should have done it already. Do you no, know, I don't, do you know I don't know. Do you know well, I'll tell you what. Why don't I do the demo? Yeah, because yeah, do I like doing demos, and I'm yeah. so good at it. Uh, sorry, I made that joke already, but it's just like it runs again. So in this case, I have got a, uh, a book class, and, and I'm, you'll be pleased to hear it. I'm not going to try and live, live code it. So here's the book class, which you saw earlier. 
Uh, it's just like, it's, there's nothing tricky about this at all. It's got, it's got a title and an author, and it's got um, uh, the equals method is defined on the, on the title and the author, as you see. And now what I want to do is I want to put those books, uh, put some books into a sorted, into a, in, into, into a couple of sets. So I've got three books here, and two of them are by uh, our fav one of our favourite authors, Ursula Le Guin, and the third one is a book that neither of us has read, but that we think we should do, called A Deepness in the Sky. And we're going to put those books into... Uh, we're, going to, we're going to make a, 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 an unmodifiable set of those, of those three books, two by Ursula Le Guin and one by Verna Vinge, and we're going to put them into a hash set, and then we're going to print that hash set out, and then we're going to put them into a tree set. Uh, the tree set's got to have a... They've got to be comparable... Or there's got to be a comparison method for a tree set. Because a tree set sorts its members, so it's got to have some way of sorting them. Either it'll sort them on the natural order of the, of the objects, which is like, because, the, because you can put things that are comparable into a, things that implement comparable into a, into a tree set, and then it'll sort them using the compare to method, the, inst the object, instance compare to method. Or you can impose an external comparator. And you can provide that to the, uh, to the tree set. And that's what I've done here. So I've said the, the comparator I've got here is a very, um, a very straightforward one. I'm just going to compare these books by their author. Right? So, and and the, author, the author field is a string. So this will uh, order these books on the natural ordering of strings, which is roughly yeah. the alphabetical so, ordering. So, yeah, basically what you're trying to achieve here is you want to you 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 a set that is sorted by author. I want to set that's sorted by author. Yep, yeah, right. Author, yeah. And, and, the author, and the author is a string. And we've got two there that are the same. So if I run this, I, I, I get the printout that show that the, the, the hash set gives me, uh, when, I, when, I, when I print out the, the, the here we are, when I, when I print out the, the, the hash set, I get these books, the, the left, the, all three of them, and when I print out the, the tree set, as you can see, I get only two of them. Why do I get only two of them? Well, the answer is because the, um, the, the, the tree set uses, for its equivalence relation, we're going to look at this, it uses the, the, uh, the, the, comparison, the, com the comparison method, which in this case says that two, that two books by the same author are equal. Right? Because, they, 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 because that's, the, that, that's how they're compared. So, the, so the, as far as it's concerned, those are duplicates. Let's see if I can find this. Sorted sets treat objects as duplicates. Those two books by Ursula Le Guin were duplicates here because the compare, the compare to method of that comparator returned zero. They were, they were equal as far as, as far as the alphabetic sorting was concerned. This is not a bug. People often say, well, there's obviously something wrong here. And there isn't exactly something wrong, but there is something that you need to understand. And, and understanding what's going on is really, is really kind of helpful. So I, I, I call this a controversy. Every set is defined by its equivalence relation. An equivalence relation is, uh, is, the, is a relation between two objects. And you, you can, uh, it's, quite, it's defined in different ways, but if the equivalence relation returns true for two objects, then the set will consider, a set using that equivalence relation will consider those objects to be duplicates. There are three, in the, you can define sets on all kinds of equivalence relations. In the JDK, there are three different kinds of sets which use different kinds of equivalence relations. The, ones, the one that you don't think of, which is identity hash set, which actually puts every object into a separate equivalence class. No two objects, right. no two objects are equivalent as far as identity hash set is concerned. The sorted sets, which consider things to be duplicates if, they com if their comparison method returns zero. We often say compare is equal, but this is a bit clearer. And there are all the others, hash set and, 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 and all the others, which use the equals method, so you can define it for yourself. And these three things are, like, they're all perfectly well-formed, but they're different. And they're, 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 they're internally consistent, and you don't get any problem about them, 
provided you understand them, even though sometimes it's a nuisance, like with the uh, like with, the, with with my book with my library, which won't accommodate books with the, more than one book with the same author. So that's not actually great. We'll have a look at how we could fix that. But there's nothing inherently wrong with this if you understand it. The problem comes if you want to uh, if, if you want if you if you want sets to interact when they have different equivalence relations. So, so th this is where this problem about uh, uh, comparison methods that are inconsistent with equals come from. The comparison method is for tree sets, it's for navigable sets. Equals is for all the other kinds of sets. And so the, the, the kinds of problems you get here is with actually quite well-defined yeah. and frequently found uh, comparison methods which are inconsistent with equals. Yeah. Me to, yeah. So, so, okay, so this is, this is a pretty subtle point, and it is not at all well explained in the documentation, so I'm not even going to reference the documentation here. No. But the idea of a comparison method is it puts things in order. And so if you have two things that have the same ordering, then, of course, they should be equals in the sense of ordering, but they should also be equals in the sense of if you call equals on them, equals should return true. And so such a comparison method is referred to as being consistent with equals. So it's hard to imagine if you have some kind of comparison method that orders things, that the ordering compares equivalent, but they're not actually equals. So it's like, how can that possibly, like, see, the usual example is like numbers. Like, so if you, if you take integers and the integer comparison method is consistent with equals, because if, two, if, they, if, they, if the ordering is the same, then in fact they will, um, uh, they will be dot equals. Okay, but it turns out that, as Morris just said, they're, com they're actually, it's very common and useful to have comparison methods that are inconsistent with equals. Even and though the, the documentation says you should never do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So one, the documentation says don't do this, and the other documentation says, oh, here's this great comparison method. In particular, string dot case insensitive order. It's pretty common to want to sort things based on uh, the string value, but without respect to case. And it's self-evident that that comparison method is inconsistent with equals. All right, so now we have a demo where we're showing this. Okay, so what happens? Um, oh, and then there are weird consequences of this when you combine set operations. Okay, so ABC capitalized and ABC are clearly different, and so they go into a hash set. So, so do the next thing there. Okay, so now let's put a couple things into a tree set that is ordered using case insensitive order. And then we'll populate that with a couple different things. All right, so these are different strings. Now, what do you think will happen if we, um, so, so it's, we've already established that it's useful for something like tree set to have a comparison method that is inconsistent with equals. The consequences of that is that you can get weird behavior and so here's a demonstration of the weird behavior. So, uh, so hit, yeah, hit the next one. Um, okay, so tree set has these two strings in it. Now, what happens if you ask the hash set whether it equals the tree set? Well, clearly, they're not equal because they have diff different strings in them, right? Well, okay. So what happens if you ask the tree set if it's equal to the hash set? True. How is this possible? Okay, so this, is de this depend the, the, the reason is how equality of sets is performed. It basically says, <coughs> um, iterate the argument, and if every element of the argument is contained in this set, then actually, no, so the other way. Uh, iterate the receiver. Yeah, iterate the receiver and say, is it contained in... Uh, Damn, I had this down. Is that right? Um, oh, no, no, I had it right the first time. You iterate the argument, and if it's contained inside of me, then if, if, if all of those return true, then, then right, the sets yeah, are equal, yeah, right? Yeah. So what tree set says is it iterates the hash set. It says capital ABC. Do I contain capital ABC? Well, I'm comparing in a case-insensitive fashion, so the answer is yes. Okay, and then it gets small ABC. Do I contain small ABC? The answer is yes, because I'm doing a case insensitive. 
uh, comparison. So tree sets notion of equality is different from hash sets notion of equality. And that's why you get asymmetry in equals. Right. OK. So this is, the, this is the problem that the side refers to when it says that problems arise between sets with equi different equivalence relations. Because, the, because they, they, they just have different ideas of what constitutes, uh, of what constitutes duplicates. So the, the, this isn't a bug. It really confuses people. And it looks, it, obviously, it looks very weird. It's because we have not understood. I mean, if, you, if, if you're unhappy about this, I won't say it's not because you've not understood. It's because you've not fully appreciated what we mean when we talk about, for example, set equality. Because there's, there's no way that you're going to be able to define set equality that won't run into this problem when you have right. sets with different equivalence relations. So the, the one question that's kind of left to ask is, how could we have a sorted set of books? I mean, like the, the thing that I started off with was, I want a sorted set of books. Right? including all of them. And I don't want to, and I, uh, I really like tree sets. It's a, it's a really nice data structure. And I, do, and I want to be able to use it without losing things. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a kind of reasonable thing to do. So the options are, we could have comparisons include all the fields that are included by equals. So that's, that's a possibility. And sometimes that will work, but it's sometimes going to be really hard and sometimes going to be really inefficient to do that. Uh, we could say, well, we're going, to, uh, we're going to have in our, have something more complicated and have our tree set use a, use a tree map, which is going to be ordered on the um, which is which is going to have the the ordered uh, the, the order key as the as the yeah the order the, the ordering key as the key to the map because of, because a tree map uh, organizes its keys in sorted order. And instead of mapping that to a single book, map it to all the books that have that author. So that's a kind of more elaborate kind of data structure. And the third possibility is let's just throw sorted lists away. We'll deprecate them and and um, resort the resort the list as uh, resort the list yeah. and just go back to my original library structure. Yeah. So so sorting a list with a comparator that is inconsistent with equals is perfectly OK, because it, list does not have this phenomenon of, of compressing out duplicates. So list always keeps all of the elements. So that's always a thing to do. All right, so that's always a safe thing to do. But the, the mistake is if somebody says, oh, I've sorted this list, maybe it'd be maybe nice if I can throw these into a, a sorted set. set. And then, then you run into this phenomenon. OK. So that is our controversy, too. Has it gone? Well, what are we going to do about this? Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, well, we could just deprecate did, navigable set. Did somebody say deprecation? <laughs> oh, I can't. Put we've it got on. the I... man here <laughs> to do it. Well, we would have the man yeah, here if, I... if he could get his white coat on. Yeah, he I'm not going to take the time. He left it buttoned up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we could deprecate. So we could deprecate these sets that have that have these uh, non-standard equivalence yeah. relations. But yeah. yeah, okay. But they're useful. Yeah, they're they're far too useful to, to get rid of. Um, and you know, yeah, okay. So that's one thing. I think that um, in some sense, the documentation tries to warn people, uh, and maybe we should strengthen the warnings about using comparison methods that are inconsistent with equals. Um, perhaps we can even disallow them. The problem is that you, I believe, it is undecidable. I mean, literally undecidable whether a particular comparison method is in fact consistent with equals, yeah. right? So this has to be something that the programmer figures out. Uh, the, the, the system cannot, say, cannot, cannot analyze a comparison method and say, oh, this is inconsistent with equals, I'm going to issue a warning or throw an exception or something like that. Um, and then similarly, there's a problem which is, OK, well, you can run into trouble. And there are other systems that do this, right? If they have their ways to define sets with different equivalence relations. And what it does is, for instance, e equals can always, if, if just like a, a list is always considered not equal to a set, you could say if you have two sets that have different equivalence relations, you could redefine them to be, to be, not, to be never equal to each other. 
The problem is, it's the same problem. You can't tell whether or not a comparison method is or is not consistent with equals. So sometimes you might want to have uh, a sorted set or a tree set with a comparison method that is consistent with equals, and you do want to be able to do those comparisons, but the system can't tell. And so either you allow things that are potentially inconsistent, or you disallow everything, which means you throw out potentially, use, potentially useful use cases. So what do you do? Yep. You have a controversy. Yes. Yeah, we definitely want a controversy over that. Okay, so I hope that's I, I kind of illuminated a little bit the uh, this very puzzle this thing that often people are very puzzled about. I've, had, I've often had people complaining in class, you know, like why does it what what happened when I tried to put things into into this sorted set, and does that mean sorted set is no use? And it doesn't mean I, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean you have to understand the problem. Okay, so. That That's it. Is th those are our controversies. Okay. And we are on to... I think to we better move on. Well, yeah. yeah, we better okay. have. We've okay. got 15, you've got 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Could I have the... Um, oh, you can have the, you can have yes. the thing. Now. Okay. It's, All right. I will so there are plenty of things actually you could possibly talk about collections features, but uh, I started writing about Valhalla, and I think that you know, it kind of filled up the rest of the time. So I'm just going to be focusing on Valhalla. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, I can't, you know, there's too much going on in Valhalla, there's so much history, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the essentials of the background, and then talk about how that impacts Java programming, and then uh, applying that to some hypothetical future uh, collections implementations, uh, and, and some insights that might arise from that. Okay, so Valhalla itself is a long-running project, I think it's been running for eight years or so. Um, you're all Java programmers, you understand that there's this, this terrible divide between primitives and objects. And so the goal of Valhalla is nothing less than healing that divide. Um, and so there's this new concept of value classes or um, instance of value classes or value objects. Um, and they have certain restrictions on them. And it looks like there's a lot of restrictions. Like instances are immutable. They cannot be extended. There's no identity. And so equals equals actually compares the values. It does not compare pointers or references because those don't exist in a, in a value class world. Uh, value objects might or might not be allocated on the heap. So that's all weird. But, you, but there are some nice things about value classes, which are their classes. They have constructors, fields, methods, static methods, generics, inner classes, and all that stuff. And so the slogan of the Valhalla project is it codes like a class, but it works like an int. And so you get the, the fast performance of, of things like, of primitives like an int, but you can actually write classes and have, have good um, object, de object design using value classes. Okay, so what do those restrictions give you? Okay, so there's some things that the JVM can do if you have a value class because of those restrictions. In particular, the JVM can freely copy the object from one place to another without you knowing it. Um, it can freely copy parts of it. Uh, and that's useful. So for instance, something can be cached in a register because it, the, the VM knows that, that certain things cannot change. Um, value classes can be flattened into arrays. And so this is a big deal because um, actually I have some, some, uh, some description coming up later about that. But right now, in the absence of Valhalla, whenever you create a new object, that almost that almost always ends up on the heap. Now, sometimes the VM can optimize that away, but in the general case is if you have, um, if, you have if, you, if, you, if, if you have some code and you say, hmm, this code and this data actually would be better if it were refactored into a different class. That has performance implications because that means that has to be allocated separately on the heap. There's a pointer to that, which is a, a Java reference. Uh, dereferencing that can potentially cause a cache miss because it might be in a different part of memory. And so there are all kinds of, 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 of things like that that can happen. Uh, and so with, with value objects, um, the VM can potentially optimize that away. So there's this, there's this uh, technique called scalarization where the, uh, the VM can uh, 
it doesn't actually have to allocate something on the heap if it's not necessary. It can allocate things on the stack if it's only a temporary, or it can just say, oh, you know, he created this new object and then these things happened with it, and so I can just store those in registers and then just move things around, and there's no actual object on the heap anywhere. And so that's pretty powerful. Um, the current design issue is around nullability, right? So primitives are not nullable and objects of reference type are nullable. And so why is, that a, why is that a big deal? If you create an array of these things, the primitives all have a default value, which is something like zero or false. And reference objects, or reference types are all null by default. So if you create an array of these things, you don't want to get into a position where you have to call a constructor for every single one of them. And so, so if, it's, if they're not nullable, then you need to provide a default value. And so there's a whole bunch of design considerations around this that's, that's currently, uh, that currently underway. So this is the current design issue. Um, and so the open question is, you know, what should value objects do? And there's some, some ideas about letting the user choose whether a value object is nullable, in which case you, uh, uh, they might end up on the heap, or... Um, if a value object is not nullable, then you have to choose what default values are on there. And, um, and there are some, some additional effects that, that are too detailed to go into here. But anyway, OK, so there's still, still this is an open design discussion. After so many years, the Valhalla project does seem to be converging on a programming model and some language changes to support this. So uh, OK, so I actually covered most of this before. Uh, basically, the idea, though, is that Creating a new class used to mean uh, a separate allocation on the heap and, and object dereferencing with the, uh, with the, the uh, um, consequential impact on uh, memory locality. And so um, <clears throat> I think the big deal that we, that at least from the point of view of collections, is that if you can flatten an object into an array instead of having an array of pointers off, you know, going every which way, then you can, you can make things more compact and a lot faster. Okay, so here's an example of what HashMap looks like today. So on the left, we have the, the table. And so, so HashMap is what is called a, um, uh, uses a technique called separate chaining. And so, uh, when, when you want to put an object into a hash map, it hashes it, and then it finds the bucket. And if there's something already there, it chains, it, it basically creates like a linked list. And so you can see that if you traverse all of the entries of this hash map, you're going to be bouncing around in a whole bunch of different places in memory. So this is, this, this is an illustration of the potential poor memory locality of something like uh, a hash map or similar data structure that has pointers and linked lists and does a lot of pointer chasing when you process it. Okay. Um, also, each actually each one of these blue squares here represents an internal node of the hash map, and so um, basically this is some JVM stuff. Uh, every every object has an object header consisting of two words of of uh, what's called a mark word. Uh, a class pointer, and then there's the actual data, which is, which is the hash of the key in the hash map, the, key, the reference to the key itself, the a reference to the value, and a next pointer, which is a pointer to the next node. So if you add all this up, every node is 32 bytes, which is kind of a lot uh, if you think about it. OK, so suppose if we had Valhalla and you, you, you were able to turn uh, a hypothetical node into an entry object, and, they was, and, and you could flatten those into a single table. So if you flatten them, then you wouldn't need next pointers. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't need an object header, because they'd all reside in the same array. So all you would need to store is the hash value, the key, and the, the maps value. And so that's only 12 bytes. So that's a big, saving, ab, that's a big absolute savings. Um, now, the table, because of the, oh, so, so, so this is storing all of the data inside a table is called uh, an, a technique called open addressing as opposed to separate chaining. Um, so it has the potential to have much better memory locality because you're not chasing pointers all over the place. You're just looking up things in an array. And you know, here's a diagram of what that looks like, right? So the array has to be bigger because collisions have to, you have to search, you have to do collision resolution by going to other places in the array. So in general, you probably need a bigger table 
uh, so that there are enough empty slots to avoid um, uh, uh, expensive uh, searches in case of collisions. But the idea is that all the data is directly in this array itself. And if there's a collision, then you can just look at the next entry and so forth. So if you do like linear probing for a collision resolution, then that's probably going to be on the same cache line. So you get much better density and you get much better data locality. So we have done some preliminary experiments about this. There's some experimental JVMs that do, do some object flattening, and the performance results are pretty promising. But you know, it's, not in, it's, it's still very far from, from production. Um, I think there's some, uh, I have a reference to presentation later on. It looks like we might be able to get some Valhalla stuff into preview uh, sometime soonish, like within the next year or so. <laughs> before before yeah. I peg out. Yeah. I want to say about that, that, ah. that business about spatial locality. That's a really big, that's a really big issue. A huge, a huge um, performance hit on modern machine architectures is, um, is cache misses. Cache misses yeah. are very, very important. They're more important than the number of, uh, by a long way, orders of magnitude more important than the number of, than the number of CPU cycles that, 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 the, um, that your code yeah. actually uses. Because, cache, because um, the memory buses are so much slower than processors nowadays that, that a cache miss, if you've got to fetch uh, data from memory instead of having it, having it um, on, on or in a, high le, in a high speed cache very near to the processor, it costs hundreds or possibly even thousands of memories of, of CPU cycles. Right. So spatial locality is just really important because it allows the caches to remain valid. Okay, right. I'm finished. Okay. Thank you. All right, so uh, earlier on I said that value objects are immutable, right? So all their fields are implicitly final. But I kind of glossed over this. Like hash map is a mutable data structure, and if we were to, you know, rearrange the hash map so that it uses open addressing and, and value types, well, we how is it going to be? You know, th doesn't that doesn't that imply that if you build something out of value objects, that whatever you build out of value objects is also going to be immutable? Answer: No. Uh, so if you have a bunch of if you have a bunch of entries inside an array, it's like how do you mutate them because they're immutable, right? Well, what you do is conceptually you replace the old object with a brand new object, right? So if I wanted to, if I wanted to write, if I, suppose I do a, a map.put, and, and I said, oh, all right, I want to replace this entry in the map with, so that it has a new value. So I get the old entry, and I create a new entry from the old entry's key, from the old entry's hash, but then I supply it with a new value. And then I take that entry and store it into the table. It's like, OK, uh, yeah, that'll work. But gee, you're creating a new object. Doesn't that allocate something on the heap? No, not necessarily. Right? This is where the JIT optimizations come in. Right? Because the, the, the JIT can say, oh, all right, well, this is a value, this value class, and I flattened this into an array. And in fact, I'm storing it in the array. And in fact, uh, the old entry in the array, the key is the same as the new entry, so I actually don't have to write anything there. And so <clears throat> a sufficiently smart compiler can, uh, that was a joke, a uh, sufficiently smart compiler can just turn this into a one word write of the new value. It's already implemented. Okay, and Remy says it's already implemented. Great, okay, so, so good, I think, think things are far along. Um, now, there are probably more complicated constructs that are harder to optimize, and so one of the things that might be a possibility is there's a new language feature called withers. Uh, this also applies to records, because what you often want to do is create a new record with these fields from an old record, but new values for certain ones. And so the same kind of construct could apply to, uh, to value objects as well as records. So anyway, it is possible to create a mutable data structure using immutable objects, and the JIT will probably be able to optimize the, the obvious slow code so that it goes really fast. All right, uh, just to wrap up, I don't have too much to say about this, but this is, this is one of the farther off things that uh, is in Valhalla, which is that uh, we want to eventually, part of, of conquering the primitive object divide is to do generic specialization. Uh, so uh, so one, one day in the future, we may finally be able to say list of int. 
I need to move on here. <laughs> okay, so here is, uh, here is the most recent overview of the current status of Valhalla from Dan Smith, one of the members of the Lang Tools team at Oracle um, at the Java, the JVM Language Summit uh, that just happened a month or two ago. Uh, and so uh, that's pretty easy to find on YouTube. All right, and we have uh, less than one minute left for Q&A, but this is how to uh, contact us. Um, thanks for staying to the bitter end. I hope it was worth your time. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you.